The Myth of the Birth of the Hero By Otto Rank Introduction The prominent civilized nations the Babylonians and Egyptians, the Hebrews and Hindus, the Persians, the Greeks and the Romans. As well as the Teutons and others all began at an early stage to glorify their national heroes mythical princes and kings, founders of religions, dynasties, empires, or cities in a number of poetic tales and legends. The history of the birth and of the early life of these personalities came to be especially invested with fantastic features. Which in different nations even though widely separated by space and entirely independent of each other present a baffling similarity or, in part, a literal correspondence. Many investigators have long been impressed with this fact, and one of the chief problems of mythological research still consists in the elucidation of the reason for the extensive analogies in the fundamental outlines of mythical tales. Which are rendered still more puzzling by the unanimity in certain details and their reappearance in most of the mythical groupings. The mythological theories, aiming at the explanation of these remarkable phenomena, are, in a general way, as follows, 1. 1. The idea of the people, propounded by Adolf Bastian. 2. This theory assumes the existence of elemental ideas, so that the unanimity of the myths is a necessary sequence of the uniform disposition of the human mind and the manner of its manifestation. Which within certain limits is identical at all times and in all places. This interpretation was urgently advocated by Adolf Bauer as accounting for the wide distribution of the hero myths. Point 3. 2. The explanation by original community, first applied by Theodore Ben Fay to the widely distributed parallel forms of folklore and fairy tales for. Originating in a favorable locality, India, these tales were first accepted by the primarily related, Indo-Germanic, peoples, then continued to grow while retaining the common primary traits, and ultimately radiated over the entire earth. This mode of explanation was first adapted to the wide distribution of the hero myths by Rudolf Schubert.5. 3. The modern theory of migration, or borrowing. According to which individual myths originate from definite peoples, especially the Babylonians, and are accepted by other peoples through oral tradition, commerce and traffic, or through literary influences. 6. The modern theory of migration and borrowing can be readily shown to be merely a modification of Benfi's theory, necessitated by newly discovered and irreconcilable material. This profound and extensive research of modern investigations has shown that India, rather than Babylonia, may be regarded as the first home of the myths. Moreover, the tales presumably did not radiate from a single point, but traveled over and across the entire inhabited globe. This brings into prominence the idea of the interdependence of mythological structures, an idea which was generalized by Braun as the basic law of the nature of the human mind, nothing new is ever discovered as long as it is possible to copy. 7. The theory of elemental ideas, so strenuously advocated by Bauer over a quarter of a century ago, is unconditionally declined by the most recent investigators, Winkler, H. Stuckin, who maintain the migration theory. There is really no such sharp contrast between the various theories or their advocates, for the concept of elemental ideas does not interfere with the claims of primary common possession or of migration. Furthermore, the ultimate problem is not whence and how the material reached a certain people, the question is, where did it come from to begin with? All these theories would explain only the variability and distribution of the myths, but not their origin. Even Schubert, the most inveterate opponent of Bauer's view, acknowledges this truth, by stating that all these manifold sagas date back to a single very ancient prototype. But he is unable to tell us anything of the origin of this prototype. Bauer likewise inclines to this mediating view. He points out repeatedly that in spite of the multiple origin of independent tales, it is necessary to concede a most extensive and ramified borrowing, as well as an original community of the concepts in related peoples. 9. The same conciliatory attitude is maintained by Lessman in a recent publication, 1908, in which he rejects the assumption of elemental ideas, but admits that primary relationship and borrowing do not exclude each other. 10. As pointed out by Wundt, however, it must be kept in mind that the appropriation of mythological contents always represents at the same time an independent mythological construction. 
because only that can be retained permanently which corresponds to the borrower's stage of mythological ideation. The faint recollections of preceding narratives would hardly suffice for the refiguration of the same material, without the persistent presence of the underlying motifs. But precisely for this reason, such motifs may produce new contents that agree in their fundamental themes, even in the absence of similar associations. 11. Leaving aside for the present the inquiry as to the mode of distribution of these myths, the origin of the hero myth in general is now to be investigated. Fully anticipating that migration, or borrowing, will prove to be directly and fairly positively demonstrable in a number of the cases. When this is not feasible, other viewpoints will have to be conceded, at least for the present, rather than bar the way to further progress by the somewhat unscientific attitude of Hugo Winkler, who says, when human beings and products exactly corresponding to each other, are found at remote parts of the earth, we must conclude that they have wandered thither. Whether we have knowledge of the how or when makes no difference in the assumption of the fact itself. Point twelve, Even granting the migration of all myths, the origin of the first myth would still have to be explained. 13. Investigations along these lines will necessarily help to provide a deeper insight into the contents of the tales. Nearly all authors who have hitherto been engaged in the interpretation of the birth myths of heroes find in them a personification of the processes of nature, following the dominant mode of natural mythological interpretation. The newborn hero is the young sun rising from the waters, first confronted by lowering clouds, but finally triumphing over all obstacles. 14 The taking into consideration of all natural, chiefly atmospheric, phenomena as was done by the first representatives of this method of myth interpretation 15 and the regarding of the legends, in a more restricted sense, as astral myths, Stuckin, Winkler, and others, are approaches not so essentially distinct as the followers of each individual direction believe to be the case. Nor does it seem a basic improvement when the purely solar interpretation, as advocated especially by Frobenius, 16 was no longer accepted and the view was advanced that all myths were originally lunar. Husing holds this theory in his discussion of the myth of Cyrus the Great, Sikh also claims this view as the only legitimate, obvious interpretation of the birth myths of the heroes, and it is a concept that is beginning to gain popularity. 17. The interpretation of the myths themselves will be taken up in detail later on, and we shall refrain here from all detailed critical comments on the above mode of explanation. Although significant, and undoubtedly in part correct, the astral theory is not altogether satisfactory and fails to afford an insight into the motives of myth formation. The objection may be raised that the tracing to astronomical processes does not fully represent the content of these myths, and that much clearer and simpler relations might be established through another mode of interpretation. The much-abused theory of elemental ideas indicates a practically neglected aspect of mythological research. At the beginning, as well as at the end of his contribution, Bauer points out how much more natural and probable it would be to seek the reason for the general unanimity of these myths in the very general traits of the human psyche, rather than in primary community or migration. This assumption appears to be more justifiable, since such general movements of the human mind are also expressed in still other forms and in other domains, where they can be demonstrated as universal. Concerning the character of these general movements of the human mind, the psychological study of the essence of these myths might help to reveal the source from which has flowed uniformly, at all times and in all places. An identical mythological content. Such a derivation of an essential constituent, from a common human source, has already been successfully attempted with one of these legendary motifs. Freud, in his interpretation of dreams, reveals the connection of the Oedipus fable where Oedipus is told by the oracle that he will kill his father and marry his mother. As he unwittingly does later with two typical dreams experienced by many now living, the dream of the father's death, and the dream of sexual intercourse with the mother. Of King Oedipus he says. His fate moves us only because it might have been our own, because the oracle laid upon us before our birth the very curse which rested upon him. It may be that we were all destined to direct our first sexual impulses toward our mothers, and our first impulses of hatred and resistance toward our fathers, our dreams convince us that we were. King Oedipus, 
who slew his father Laius and wedded his mother Jocasta, is nothing more or less than a wish fulfillment the fulfillment of the wish of our childhood. 18. The manifestation of the intimate relationship between dream and myth not only in regard to the content but also as to the form and motor forces of this and many other, more particularly pathological. Psyche structures entirely justifies the interpretation of the myth as a dream of the masses of the people, which I have recently shown elsewhere. At the same time, the transference of the method, and in part also of the results, of Freud's technique of dream interpretation to the myths would seem to be justifiable, as was defended by Abraham, and illustrated in an example. In his paper on, Dreams and Myths. In the circle of myths that follow, the intimate relations between dream and myth find further confirmation, with frequent opportunity for reasoning from analogy. The hostile attitude of the most modern mythological tendency, chiefly represented by the Society for Comparative Mythological Research, against all attempts at establishing a relation between dream and myth is for the most part the outcome of the restriction of the parallelization to the so-called nightmares, Altraum. As attempted in Leistner's notable book, and also of ignorance of the relevant teachings of Freud. 19 The latter not only help us to understand the dreams themselves but also show their symbolism and close relationship with all psychic phenomena in general, especially with daydreams or fantasies, with artistic creativeness. And with certain disturbances of the normal psychic function. A common share in all these productions belongs to a single psychic function, the human imagination. It is to this imaginative faculty of humanity at large rather than of the individual that the modern myth theory is obliged to concede a high rank, perhaps the first, as the ultimate source of all myths. The interpretation of the myths in the astral sense or more accurately speaking, as, almanac tales, gives rise to the query, in view of a creative imagination in humanity. Should we seek, with Lessman, for the first germ of the origin of such tales precisely in the processes of the heavens, or on the contrary. Should we conclude that ready-made tales of an entirely different, but presumably psychic, origin were only subsequently transferred to the heavenly bodies? 20 Ehrenreich makes a more positive admission, the mythologic evolution certainly begins on terrestrial soil, in so far as experiences must first be gathered in the immediate surroundings before they can be projected into the heavenly universe. 21 and Wundt tells us that the theory of the evolution of mythology according to which it first originates in the heavens, whence at a later date it descends to earth, is contradictory both to the history of the myth, which is unaware of such a migration, and to the psychology of myth formation, which must repudiate such a translocation as internally impossible. 22 We are also convinced that the myths, 23 originally at least, are structures of the human faculty of imagination, which were at some time projected for certain reasons upon the heavens, and may be secondarily transferred to the heavenly bodies. With their baffling phenomena. The significance of the unmistakable traces the fixed figures, and so forth that have been imprinted upon the myth by this transference must by no means be underrated, although the origin of these figures was possibly psychic in character. They were subsequently made the basis of the almanac and firmament calculations precisely on account of this significance. In a general way, it would seem as if the investigators who apply an exclusively natural scheme of interpretation have been unable. In any sense in their endeavor to discover the original sense of the myths to get away entirely from a psychological process such as must be assumed similarly for the creators of the myths. 24 The motive is identical, and led to the same course for myth creators and for myth interpreters. It is most naively uttered by one of the founders and champions of comparative myth investigation and of the natural mythological mode of interpretation. Max Muller points out in his essays that this procedure not only invests meaningless legends with a significance and beauty of their own but also helps to remove some of the most revolting features of classical mythology as well as to elucidate their true meaning. 25 This readily understandable revulsion naturally prevents the mythologist from assuming that such motifs incest with mother, sister, or daughter. Murder of father, grandfather, or brother could be based on universal fantasies, which according to Freud's teachings have their source in the infantile psyche, with its peculiar interpretation of the external world and its denizens. This revulsion is, therefore, 
only the reaction of the dimly sensed painful recognition of the actuality of these relations. And this reaction impels the myth interpreters, for their own subconscious rehabilitation, and that of all mankind, to credit these motifs with an entirely different meaning from their original significance. The same internal repudiation prevents the myth-creating people from believing in the possibility of such revolting thoughts, and this defense probably was the first reason for projecting these relations onto the firmament. The psychological pacifying through such a rehabilitation, by projection upon external and remote objects, can still be realized to a certain degree, at least by a glance at one of these interpretations. For instance that of the objectionable Oedipus fable, as given by Goldheiser, a representative of the natural school of myth interpreters, Oedipus, who kills his father, marries his mother, and dies old and blind, is the solar hero who murders his procreator, the darkness. He shares his couch with his mother, the gloaming, from whose lap, the dawn, he has been born, he dies, blinded, as the setting sun. 26. It is understandable that some such interpretation is more soothing to the mind than the revelation of the fact that incest and murder impulses against their nearest relatives are found in the fantasies of most people. As remnants of infantile ideation. But this is not a scientific argument, and revulsion of this kind although it may not always be equally conscious is altogether out of place in view of existing facts. One must either become reconciled to these indecencies, provided they are felt to be such, or one must abandon the study of psychological phenomena. It is evident that human beings, even in the earliest times, and with a most naive imagination, never saw incest and parasite in the firmament on high, 27 but it is far more probable that these ideas are derived from another source. Presumably human. In what way they came to reach the sky, and what modifications or additions they received in the process, are questions of a secondary character that cannot be settled until the psychic origin of the myths in general has been established. At any rate, besides the astral conception, the claims of the part played by the psychic life must be credited with the same rights for myth formation, and this argument will be amply vindicated by the results of our method of interpretation. With this object in view, we shall first take up in the following pages the legendary material on which such a psychological interpretation is to be attempted on a large scale for the first time. How do you find this book? Any thoughts about the book or the author? Any suggestion for improvement? Please take a moment to share your thoughts in a comment. If you like it, share it with your friends who might enjoy it as well. Subscribe to keep in touch. Visit CompleteAudiobooks.com for more quality content. Note for the Circle of Myths From the mass of chiefly biographic hero myths, we have selected those that are best known and some that are especially characteristic. 28 These myths will be given in abbreviated form, as far as relevant for this investigation, with statements concerning the sources. Attention will be called to the most important and constantly recurring motifs by the use of italic type. Sargon. Probably the oldest transmitted hero myth in our possession is derived from the period of the foundation of Babylonia, about 2800 BC, and concerns the birth history of its founder, Sargon I. 29 The literal translation of the report according to the mode of rendering, it appears to be an original inscription by King Sargon himself is as follows. Sargon, the mighty king, king of Agade, am I. My mother was a vestal, my father I knew not, while my father's brother dwelt in the mountains. In my city Azurapani, which is situated on the bank of the Euphrates, my mother, the Vestal, bore me. In a hidden place she brought me forth. She laid me in a vessel made of reeds, closed my door with pitch, and dropped me down into the river, which did not drown me. The river carried me to Aki, the water carrier. Aki the water carrier lifted me up in the kindness of his heart, Aki the water carrier raised me as his own son, Aki the water carrier made of me his gardener. In my work as a gardener I was beloved by Ishtar, I became the king, and for forty-five years I held kingly sway. Point thirty. Moses The biblical birth history of Moses, which is told in the second chapter of Exodus, presents the greatest similarity to the Sargon legend, even an almost literal correspondence of individual traits. 31 Already the first chapter, 22, 
relates that Pharaoh commanded his people to throw into the river all sons that were born to Hebrews, while the daughters were permitted to live. The reason for this order is given as fear of the overfertility of the Israelites. The second chapter continues as follows. And there went a man of the house of Levi, and took to wife a daughter of Levi. 32 And the woman conceived, and bare a son, and when she saw him that he was a goodly child, she hid him three months. And when she could not longer hide him, she took for him an ark of bulrushes, and daubed it with slime and with pitch, and put the child therein and she laid it in the flags by the river's brink. And his sister stood afar off, to wit what would be done to him. And the daughter of Pharaoh came down to wash herself at the river, and her maidens walked along by the river's side. And when she saw the ark among the flags, she sent her maid to fetch it. And when she had opened it, she saw the child and, behold, the babe wept. And she had compassion on him and said, This is one of the Hebrews' children. Then said his sister to Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and call to thee a nurse of the Hebrew women, that she may nurse the child for thee? And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Go. And the maid went and called the child's mother. And Pharaoh's daughter said unto her, Take this child away, and nurse it for me, and I will give thee thy wages. And the woman took the child, and nursed it. And the child grew, and she brought him unto Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son. And she called his name Moses, thirty-three and she said, Because I drew him out of the water. This account is ornamented by rabbinical mythology with an account of the events preceding Moses' birth. In the sixtieth year after Joseph's death, the reigning Pharaoh saw in a dream an old man who held a pair of scales. All the inhabitants of Egypt lay on one side, with only a suckling iamb on the other, but nevertheless this outweighed all the Egyptians. The startled king at once consulted the wise men and astrologers, who declared the dream to mean that a son would be born to the Israelites who would destroy all Egypt. The king was frightened, and at once ordered the death of all newborn children of the Israelites in the entire country. On account of this tyrannical order, the Levite Amram, who lived in Goshen, decided to separate from his wife Jochebed, so as not to foredoom to certain death the children conceived through him. But this resolution was opposed later on by his daughter Miriam, who foretold with prophetic assurance that precisely the child suggested in the king's dream would come forth from her mother's womb, and would become the liberator of his people. 34. Amram therefore rejoined his wife, from whom he had been separated for three years. At the end of three months, she conceived, and later on bore a boy at whose birth the entire house was illuminated by an extraordinary luminous radiance, suggesting the truth of the prophecy. 35. Similar accounts are given of the birth of the ancestor of the Hebrew nation, Abraham. He was a son of Turan Nimrod's captain and Amtali. Prior to his birth, it was revealed to King Nimrod from the stars that the coming child would overthrow the thrones of powerful princes and take possession of their lands. King Nimrod planned to have the child killed immediately after its birth. But when the boy was requested from Turah, he said, Truly a son was born to me, but he has died. He then delivered a strange child, concealing his own son in a cave underneath the ground, where God permitted him to suck milk from a finger of the right hand. In this cave, Abraham is said to have remained until the third, according to others the tenth, year of his life. Point thirty-six. In the next generation, in the story of Isaac, the same mythological motifs appear. Prior to his birth, King Abimelech is warned by a dream not to touch Sarah, as this would cause woe to betide him. After a long period of barrenness, she finally bears her son, who, in later life, in this report, after having been destined to be sacrificed by his own father, Abraham, is ultimately rescued by God. But Abraham casts out his elder son Ishmael, with Hagar, the boy's mother. Point 37. Karna. A close relationship with the Sargon legend is also shown in certain features of the ancient Hindu epic Mahabharata, in its account of the birth of the hero Karna. Point 38. The contents of the legend are briefly rendered by Lassen. 39. The princess Pritha, also known as Kunthi, bore as a virgin the boy Karna, whose father was the sun god Surya. The young Karna was born with the golden ear ornaments of his father and with an unbreakable coat of mail. 
the mother in her distress concealed and exposed the boy. In the adaptation of the myth by A. Holtzman, verse 1458 reads, Then my nurse and I made a large basket of rushes, placed a lid thereon, and lined it with wax. Into this basket I laid the boy and carried him down to the river Akva. Floating on the waves, the basket reaches the river Ganges and travels as far as the city of Kampa. There was passing along the bank of the river, the charioteer, the noble friend of Dhritarashtra, and with him was Radha, his beautiful and pious spouse. She was wrapped in deep sorrow, because no son had been given to her. On the river she saw the basket, which the waves carried close to her on the shore, she showed it to Azarath, who went and drew it forth from the waves. The two take care of the boy and raise him as their own child. Kunthi later on marries King Pandu, who is forced to refrain from conjugal intercourse by the curse that he is to die in the arms of his spouse. But Kunthi bears three sons, again through divine conception, one of the children being born in the cave of a wolf. One day Panda dies in the embrace of his second wife. The sons grow up, and at a tournament which they arrange, Karna appears to measure his strength against the best fighter, Arjuna, the son of Kunthi. Arjuna scoffingly refuses to fight the charioteer's son. In order to make him a worthy opponent, one of those present anoints him as king. Meanwhile Kunthi has recognized Karna as her son, by the divine mark, and prays him to desist from the contest with his brother, revealing to him the secret of his birth. But he considers her revelation as a fantastic tale, and insists implacably upon satisfaction. He falls in the combat, struck by Arjuna's arrow. 40. A striking resemblance to the entire structure of the Karna legend is presented by the birth history of Ion, the ancestor of the Ionians. The following account is based on a relatively late tradition. 41. Apollo, in the grotto of the rock of the Athenian Acropolis, procreated a son with Creusa, the daughter of Erechtheus. In this grotto the boy was also born, and exposed. The mother leaves the child behind in a woven basket, in the hope that Apollo will not leave his son to perish. At Apollo's request, Hermes carries the child the same night to Delphi, where the priestess finds him on the threshold of the temple in the morning. She brings the boy up, and when he has grown into a youth makes him a servant of the temple. Erechtheus later gave his daughter Creusa in marriage to Zuthus. As the marriage long remained childless, they addressed the Delphian oracle, praying to be blessed with progeny. The god reveals to Zuthus that the first to meet him on leaving the sanctuary is his son. He hastens outside and meets the youth, whom he joyfully greets as his own son, giving him the name Ion, which means, Walker. Creusa refuses to accept the youth as her son, her attempt to poison him fails, and the infuriated people turn against her. Ion is about to attack her, but Apollo, who does not wish the son to kill his own mother, enlightens the mind of the priestess so that she understands the connection. By means of the basket in which the newborn child had lain, Creusa recognizes him as her son, and reveals to him the secret of his birth. Oedipus The parents of Oedipus, King Laius and his queen, Jocasta, lived for a long time in childless wedlock. Laius, who longs for an heir, asks the Delphic Apollo for advice. The oracle answers that he may have a son if he so desires. But fate has ordained that his own son will kill him. Fearing the fulfillment of the oracle, Laius refrains from conjugal relations, but being intoxicated one day he nevertheless procreates a son, whom he causes to be exposed in the river Scythian, barely three days after his birth. In order to be quite sure that the child will perish, Laius orders his ankles to be pierced. According to the account of Sophocles, which is not the oldest, however, the shepherd who has been entrusted with the exposure, surrenders the boy to a shepherd of King Polybus, of Corinth, at whose court he is brought up. According to the universal statement. Others say that the boy was exposed in a box on the sea, and was taken from the water by Paraboa, the wife of King Polybus, as she was rinsing her clothes by the shore. Point 42 Polybus brought him up as his own son. Oedipus, on hearing accidentally that he is a foundling, asks the Delphian oracle about his true parents, but receives only the prophecy that he will kill his father and marry his mother. 
In the belief that this prophecy refers to his foster parents, he flees from Corinth to Thebes, but on the way unwittingly kills his father Laius. By solving a riddle, he frees the city from the plague of the Sphinx, a man-devouring monster, and in reward is given the hand of Jocasta, his mother, as well as the throne of his father. The revelation of these horrors and the subsequent misfortune of Oedipus were a favorite subject for spectacular display among the Greek tragedians. An entire series of Christian legends have been elaborated on the pattern of the Oedipus myth, and the summarized contents of the Judas legend may serve as a paradigm of this group. Before his birth, his mother, Cybered, is warned by a dream that she will bear a wicked son, to the ruin of all his people. The parents expose the boy in a box on the sea. The waves cast the child ashore on the Isle of Scariot, where the childless queen finds him, and brings him up as her son. Later on, the royal couple have a son of their own, and the foundling, who feels himself slighted, kills his foster brother. As a fugitive from the country, he takes service at the court of Pilate, who makes a confidant of him and places him above his entire household. In a fight, Judas kills a neighbor, without knowing that he is his father. The widow of the murdered man his own mother then becomes his wife. After the revelation of these horrors, he repents and seeks the Savior, who receives him among his apostles. His betrayal of Jesus is known from the Gospels. The Legend of Esti Gregory on the stone the subject of the narrative of Hartmann von Au represents a more complicated type of this mythological cycle. Gregory, the child of the incestuous union of royal lovers, is exposed by his mother in a box on the sea, saved and raised by fishermen, and is then educated in a convent for the church. But he prefers the life of a knight, is victorious in combats, and in reward is given the hand of the princess, his mother. After the discovery of the incest, Gregory does penance for seventeen years on a rock in the midst of the sea, and he is finally made the Pope, at the command of God. 43. A very similar legend is the Persian epic of King Darab, told by the poet Ferdowsi.44 The last Karanian Bayman nominated as his successor his daughter and simultaneous wife Yumai, his son Sazan was grieved and withdrew into solitude. A short time after the death of her husband, Yumai gave birth to a son, whom she resolved to expose. He was placed in a box, which was put into the Euphrates and drifted downstream, until it was stopped by a stone that had been placed in the water by a tanner. The box with the child was found by him, and he carried the boy to his wife, who had recently lost her own child. The couple agreed to raise the foundling. As the boy grew up, he soon became so strong that the other children were unable to resist him. He did not care for the work of his foster father, but learned to be a warrior. His foster mother was forced by him to reveal the secret of his origin, and he joined the army that Humai was then sending out to fight the king of Rim. Her attention being called to him by his bravery, Humai readily recognized him as her son, and named him her successor. Paris The famed Greek legend of the birth of Paris relates that King Priam of Troy had with his wife Hecuba a son, named Hector. When Hecuba was about to bear another child, she dreamed that she brought forth a burning log of wood, which set fire to the entire city. Priam asked the advice of Isakos, who was his son with his first wife, Arisbe, and an expert in the interpretation of dreams. Isakos declared that the child would bring trouble upon the city, and advised that it be exposed. Priam gave the little boy to a slave, Agelaus, who carried him to the top of Mount Ida. The child was nursed during five days by a she-bear. When Agelaus found that he was still alive, he picked him up, and carried him home to raise him. He named the boy Paris, but after the child had grown into a strong and handsome youth, he was called Alexander, because he fought the robbers and protected the flocks. Before long he discovered his parents. How this came about is told by Hyginus, according to whose report the infant is found by shepherds. One day messengers, sent by Priam, come to these herders to fetch a bull which is to serve as the prize for the victor in some commemorative games. They selected a bull that Paris valued so highly that he followed the men who led the beast away, assisted in the combats, and won the prize. This aroused the anger of his brother Deiphobus, who threatened him with his sword, but his sister Cassandra recognized him as her brother, 
and Priam joyfully received him as his son. The misfortune which Paris later brought to his family in his native city, through the abduction of Helen, is well known from Homer's Iliad, as well as from countless earlier and later poems. A certain resemblance with the story of the birth of Paris is presented by the poem of Zhao, in Ferdowsi's Persian hero myths. 45 The first son is born to Sam, king of Sistan, by one of his consorts. Because he had white hair, his mother concealed the birth. But the nurse reveals the birth of his son to the king. Sam is disappointed, and commands that the child be exposed. The servants carry it to the top of Mount Elbers, where it is raised by the Seamert, a powerful bird. The full-grown youth is seen by a traveling caravan, whose members speak of him as, whose nurse a bird is sufficient. King Sam once sees his son in a dream, and sallies forth to seek the exposed child. He is unable to reach the summit of the elevated rock where he finally espies the youth. But the Seamert bears his son down to him. He receives him joyfully and nominates him as his successor. Telephus. Alios, king of Tegea, was informed by the oracle that his sons would perish through a descendant of his daughter. He therefore made his daughter Og a priestess of the goddess Athena, and threatened her with death should she mate with a man. But when Hercules dwelt as a guest in the sanctuary of Athena, on his expedition against Augeus, he saw the maiden, and while intoxicated, he raped her. When Alios became aware of her pregnancy, he delivered her to Nauplius, a rough sailor, with the command to throw her into the sea. But on the way she gave birth to Telephus on Mount Parthenios, and Nauplius, unmindful of the orders he had received, carried both her and the child to Mysia, where he delivered them to King Tuthras. According to another version, Og secretly brought forth as a priestess, but kept the child hidden in the temple. When Alios discovered the sacrilege, he caused the child to be exposed in the Parthenian mountains. Nauplius was instructed to sell the mother in foreign lands, or to kill her. She was delivered by him into the hands of Tuthras. 46. According to the current tradition, Og exposes the newborn child and escapes to Mysia, where the childless king Tuthras adopts her as his daughter. The boy, however, is nursed by a doe, and is found by shepherds who take him to King Corythus. The king brings him up as his son. When Telephus has grown into a youth, he betakes himself to Mysia, on the advice of the oracle, to seek his mother. He frees Tuthras, who is in danger from his enemies, and in reward receives the hand of the supposed daughter of the king, namely his own mother Og. But she refuses to submit to Telephus, and when he in his ire is about to pierce the disobedient one with his sword, she calls on her lover Hercules in her distress, and Telephus thus recognizes his mother. After the death of Tuthras he becomes king of Mysia. Perseus Acrisius, the king of Argos, had already reached an advanced age without having male progeny. As he desired a son, he consulted the Delphian oracle, but this warned him against male descendants, and informed him that his daughter Danae would bear a son through whose hand he would perish. In order to prevent this, he had his daughter locked up in an iron tower, which he caused to be carefully guarded. But Zeus penetrated through the roof, in the guise of a golden shower, and Danae became the mother of a boy. 47 One day Acrisius heard the voice of young Perseus in his daughter's room, and in this way learned that she had given birth to a child. He killed the nurse, but carried his daughter with her son to the domestic altar of Zeus, to have an oath taken on the true father's name. But he refuses to believe his daughter's statement that Zeus is the father, and he encloses her with the child in a box, which is cast into the sea. 48 The box is carried by the waves to the coast of Seriphos, where Dictes, a fisherman, usually called the brother of King Polydectes, saves mother and child by drawing them out of the sea with his nets. Dictes leads the two into his house and keeps them as his relations. Polydectes, however, becomes enamored of the beautiful mother, and as Perseus was in his way, he tried to remove him by sending him forth to fetch the head of the Gorgon Medusa. But against the king's anticipations Perseus accomplishes this difficult task, and a number of heroic deeds besides. Later, in throwing the discs during a contest, he accidentally kills his grandfather, as foretold by the oracle. He becomes the king of Argos, then of Tyrans, 
and the builder of Mycenae.49. Gilgamesh. Alien, who lived about 200 AD, relates in his Animal Stories the history of a boy who was saved by an eagle. Animals have a characteristic fondness for man. An eagle is known to have nourished a child. I shall tell the entire story, in proof of my assertion. When Senecoros reigned over the Babylonians, the Chaldean fortune tellers foretold that the son of the king's daughter would take the kingdom from his grandfather. This verdict was a prophecy of the Chaldeans. The king was afraid of this prophecy, and humorously speaking, he became a second Acrisius for his daughter, over whom he watched with the greatest severity. But his daughter, fate being wiser than the Babylonian, conceived secretly from an inconspicuous man. For fear of the king, the guardians threw the child down from the Acropolis, where the royal daughter was imprisoned. The eagle, with his keen eyes, saw the boy's fall, and before the child struck the earth, he caught it on his back, bore it into a garden, and set it down with great care. When the overseer of the place saw the beautiful boy, he was pleased with him and raised him. The boy received the name Gilgamesh, and became the king of Babylonia. If anyone regards this as a fable, I have nothing to say, although I have investigated the matter to the best of my ability. Also of Achaemenes, the Persian, from whom the nobility of the Persians is derived, I learn that he was the pupil of an eagle.50. Cyrus. The myth of Cyrus the Great, which the majority of investigators place in the center of this entire mythical circle without entirely sufficient grounds, it would appear has been transmitted to us in several versions. According to the report of Herodotus, about 450 BC, who states that among four renderings known to him, he selected the least, glorifying, version. 51 The story of the birth and youth of Cyrus is as follows. Royal sway over the Medes was held, after Cyaxares, by his son Astyages, who had a daughter named Mandane. Once he saw, in a dream, so much water passing from her as to fill an entire city and inundate all Asia. He related his dream to the dream interpreters among the magicians, and was in great fear after they had explained it all to him. When Mandane had grown up, he gave her in marriage, not to a Mede, his equal in birth, but to a Persian, by name of Cambyses. This man came of a good family and led a quiet life. The king considered him of lower rank than a middle-class Mede. After Mandane had become the wife of Cambyses, Astyage saw another dream vision in the first year. He dreamed that a vine grew from his daughter's lap, and this vine overshadowed all Asia. After he had again related this vision to the dream interpreters, he sent for his daughter, who was with child, and after her arrival from Persia, he watched her, because he meant to kill her offspring. For the dream interpreters among the magicians had prophesied to him that his daughter's son would become king in his place. In order to avert this fate, he waited until Cyrus was born, and then sent for Harpagos, who was his relative and his greatest confidant among the Medes, and whom he had placed over all his affairs. Him he addressed as follows, My dear Harpagos, I shall charge thee with an errand which thou must conscientiously perform. But do not deceive me, and let no other man attend to it, for all might not go well with thee. Take this boy, whom Mandane has brought forth, carry him home, and kill him. Afterwards thou canst bury him, how and in whatsoever manner thou desirest. But Harpagos made answer, Great king, never hast thou found thy servant disobedient, and also in future I shall beware not to sin before thee. If such is thy will, it behooves me to carry it out faithfully. When Harpagos had thus spoken, and the little boy with all his ornaments had been delivered into his hands, for death, he went home weeping. On his arrival he told his wife all that Astyages had said to him. But she inquired, What art thou about to do? He made reply, I shall not obey Astyages, even if he raved and stormed ten times worse than he is doing. I shall not do as he wills, and consent to such a murder. I have a number of reasons, in the first place, the boy is my blood relative, then, Astyages is old, and he has no male heir. Should he die, and the kingdom go to his daughter, whose son he bids me kill at present, would I not run the greatest danger? But the boy must die, for the sake of my safety. However, 
one of Astiach's men is to be his murderer, not one of mine. Having thus spoken, he at once dispatched a messenger to one of the king's cattle herders, by name Mithridates, who, as he happened to know, was keeping his herd in a very suitable mountain pasturage, full of wild animals. The herder's wife was also a slave of Astiach's, by name Sino in Greek, or Spaco, a bitch, in the Median language. When the herder hurriedly arrived, on the command of Harpagos, the latter said to him, Astiach bids thee take this boy and expose him in the wildest mountains, that he may perish as promptly as may be. And the king has ordered me to say to thee, If thou doest not kill the boy, but let him live, in whatever way, thou art to die a most disgraceful death. And I am charged to see to it that the boy is really exposed. When the herder had listened to this, he took the boy, went home, and arrived in his cottage. His wife was with child, and was in labor the entire day, and it happened that she was just bringing forth, when the herder had gone to the city. They were greatly worried about each other. But when he had returned and the woman saw him again so unexpectedly, she asked in the first place why Harpagos had sent for him so hurriedly. But he said, My dear wife, would that I had never seen what I have seen and heard in the city, and what has happened to our masters. The house of Harpagos was full of cries and laments. This startled me, but I entered, and soon after I had entered, I saw a small boy lying before me, who struggled and cried and was dressed in fine garments and gold. When Harpagos saw me, he bid me quickly take the boy, and expose him in the wildest spot of the mountains. He said Astyages had ordered this, and added awful threats if I failed to do so. I took the child and went away with it, thinking that it belonged to one of the servants, for it did not occur to me whence it had come. But on the way, I learned the entire story from the servant who led me from the city, and placed the boy in my hands. He is the son of Mandane, daughter of Astyages, and Cambyses, the son of Cyrus, and Astyages has ordered his death. Behold, here is the boy. Having thus spoken, the herder uncovered the child and showed it to her, and when the woman saw that he was a fine strong child, she wept, and fell at her husband's feet, and implored him not to expose it. But he said he could not do otherwise, for Harpagos would send servants to see if this had been done, he would have to die a disgraceful death unless he did so. Then she said again, If I have failed to move thee, do as follows, so that they may see an exposed child, I have brought forth a dead child, take it and expose it, but the son of the daughter of Astyages we will raise as our own child. In this way, thou wilt not be found a disobedient servant, nor will we fare ill ourselves. Our stillborn child will be given a kingly burial, and the living child's life will be preserved. The herder did as his wife had begged and advised him to do. He placed his own dead boy in a basket, dressed him in all the finery of the other, and exposed him on the most desert mountain. Three days later he announced to Harpagos that he was now enabled to show the boy's cadaver. Harpagos sent his most faithful body guardians, and ordered the burial of the cattle herder's son. The other boy, however, who was known later on as Cyrus, was brought up by the herder's wife. They did not call him Cyrus, but gave him another name. When the boy was twelve years old the truth was revealed, through the following accident. He was playing on the road, with other boys of his own age, in the village where the cattle were kept. The boys played king, and elected the supposed son of the cattle herder. Point fifty two. but he commanded some to build houses, others to carry lances. One he made the king's watchman, the other was charged with the bearing of messages, briefly, each received his appointed task. One of the boys' playmates, however, was the son of Artembers, a respected man among the Medes, and when he did not do as Cyrus ordained, the latter made the other boys seize him. The boys obeyed, and Cyrus chastised him with severe blows. After they let him go, he became furiously angry, as if he had been treated improperly. He ran into the city and complained to his father of what Cyrus had done to him. He did not mention the name of Cyrus for he was not yet called so, but said the cattle herder's son. Artembers went wrathfully with his son to Astyages, complained of the disgraceful treatment, and spoke thus, Great king, we suffer such outrageous treatment from thy servant, the herder's son, and he showed him his own son's shoulders. When Astyages heard and saw this, 
he wished to vindicate the boy for the sake of Artembers, and he sent for the cattle herder with his son. When both were present, Astyage looked at Cyrus and said, Thou, a lowly man's son, hast had the effrontery to treat so disgracefully the son of a man whom I greatly honour. But he made answer, Lord, he has only received his due. For the boys in the village, he being among them, were at play, and made me their king, believing me to be the best adapted thereto. And the other boys did as they were told, but he was disobedient, and did not mind me at all. For this he has received his reward. If I have deserved punishment, here I am at your service. When the boy spoke in this way, Astyage knew him at once. For the features of the face appeared to him as his own, and the answer was that of a highborn youth, furthermore, it seemed to him that the time of the exposure agreed with the boy's age. This smote his heart, and he remained speechless for a while. Hardly had he regained control over himself, when he spoke to get rid of Artembers, so as to be able to question the cattle herder without witnesses. My dear Artembers, he said, I shall take care that neither thou nor thy son shall have cause for complaint. Thus he dismissed Artembers. Cyrus, however, was led into the palace by the servants, on the command of Astyage, and the cattle herder bade to stay behind. When he was all alone with him, Astyage questioned him whence he had obtained the boy, and who had given the child into his hands. But the herder said that he was his own son, and that the woman who had borne him was living with him. Astyage remarked that he was very unwise, to look out for most cruel tortures, and he beckoned the sword-bearers to take hold of him. As he was being led to torture, the herder confessed the whole story, from beginning to end, the entire truth, finally beginning to beg and implore forgiveness and pardon. Meanwhile Astyage was not so incensed against the herder, who had revealed to him the truth, as against Harpagos. He ordered the sword-bearers to summon him, and when Harpagos stood before him, Astyage asked him as follows, My dear Harpagos, in what fashion hast thou taken the life of my daughter's son, whom I once delivered over to thee? Seeing the cattle herder standing near, Harpagos did not resort to untruthfulness, for fear that he would be refuted at once, and so he proceeded to tell the truth. Astyage concealed the anger which he had aroused in him, and first told him what he had learned from the herder, then he mentioned that the boy was still living, and that everything had turned out all right. He said that he had greatly regretted what he had done to the child, and that his daughter's reproaches had pierced his soul. But as everything has ended so well, send thy son to greet the newcomer, and then come to eat with me, for I am ready to prepare a feast in honour of the gods who have brought all this about. When Harpagos heard this, he prostrated himself on the ground before the king, and praised himself for his error having turned out well, and for being invited to the king's table, in commemoration of a happy event. So he went home, and when he arrived there, he at once sent off his only son, a boy of about thirteen years, telling him to go to Astyage's, and to do as he was bid. Then Harpagos joyfully told his wife what had befallen him. But Astyage butchered the son of Harpagos when he came, cut him to pieces, and roasted the flesh in part, another portion of the flesh was cooked, and when everything was prepared he kept it in readiness. When the hour of the meal had come, Harpagos and the other guests arrived. A table with sheep's meat was arranged in front of Astyage and the others, but Harpagos was served with his own son's flesh, without the head, and without the choppings of hands and feet, but with everything else. These parts were kept hidden in a basket. When Harpagos seemed to have taken his fill, Astyage asked him if the meat had tasted good to him, and when Harpagos answered that he had enjoyed it, the servants, who had been ordered to do so, brought in his own son's covered head. With the hands and feet, stepped up to Harpagos, and told him to uncover and take what he desired. Harpagos did so, uncovered the basket, and saw the remnants of his son. When he saw this, he did not give way to his horror, but controlled himself. Astyage then asked him if he knew of what game he had eaten. And he replied that he knew it very well, and that whatever the king did was well done. Thus he spoke, took the flesh that remained, and went home with it, where he probably meant to bury it together. This was the revenge of Astyage upon Harpagos. Concerning Cyrus, he took counsel, and summoned the same magicians who had explained his dream, then he asked them how they had at one time interpreted his vision in a dream. 
but they said that the boy must become a king, if he remained alive, and did not die prematurely. Astyage made reply, the boy is alive, and is here, and as he was staying in the country, the boys of the village elected him for their king. But he did everything like the real kings, for he ordained to himself as the master, sword-bearers, gatekeepers, messengers, and everything. How do you mean to interpret this? The magicians made reply, If the boy is alive, and has been made king without the help of anyone, thou canst be at ease so far as he is concerned, and be of good cheer, for he will not again be made a king. Already several prophecies of ours have applied to insignificant trifles, and what rests upon dreams is apt to be vain. Astyages made reply, Ye sorcerers, I am entirely of your opinion that the dream has been fulfilled when the boy was king in name, and that I have nothing more to fear from him. Yet counsel me carefully as to what is safest for my house and for yourselves. Then the magician said, Send the boy away, that he may get out of thy sight, send him to the land of the Persians, to his parents. When Astyage had heard this, he was greatly pleased. He sent for Cyrus, and said to him, My son, I have wronged thee greatly, misled by a deceitful dream, but thy good fortune has saved thee. Now go cheerfully to the land of the Persians. I shall give thee safe conduct. There wilt thou find a very different father, and a very different mother than the herders, Mithridates and his wife. Thus spake Astyage, and Cyrus was sent away. When he arrived in the house of Cambyses, his parents received him with great joy when they learned who he was, for they believed him to have perished at that time, and they desired to know how he had been preserved. He told them that he had believed himself to be the son of the cattle herder, but had learned everything on the way from the companions whom Astyage had sent with him. He related that the cattle herder's wife had saved him, and praised her throughout. The bitch, Spacco, played the principal part in his conversation. The parents took hold of this name, so that the preservation of the child might appear still more wonderful, and thus was laid the foundation of the myth that the exposed Cyrus was nursed by a bitch. Later on, Cyrus, on the instigation of Harpagos, stirred up the Persians against the Medes. War was declared, and Cyrus, at the head of the Persians, conquered the Medes in battle. Astyage was taken prisoner alive, but Cyrus did not harm him, and kept him with him until his end. Herodotus' report concludes with the words, but from that time on the Persians and Cyrus reigned over Asia. Thus was Cyrus born and raised, and made a king. The report of Pompeius Trogus is preserved only in the extract by Justin, according to whom Astyage had a daughter but no male heir. 53 This version continues. In his dream he saw a vine grow forth from her lap, the sprouts of which overshadowed all Asia. The dream interpreters declared that the vision signified the magnitude of his grandson, whom his daughter was to bear. But also his own loss of his dominions. In order to banish this dread, Astyage gave his daughter in marriage neither to a prominent man nor to a Mede, so that his grandson's mind might not be uplifted by the paternal estate besides the maternal. But he married her to Cambyses, a middle-class man from the then unknown people of the Persians. But this was not enough to banish the fears of Astyages, and he summoned his pregnant daughter, in order to have her infant destroyed before his eyes. When a boy had been born, he gave him to Harpagos, his friend and confidant, to kill him. For fear that the daughter of Astyages would take revenge upon him for the death of her boy, when she came to reign after her father's death, he delivered the boy to the king's herder for exposure. At the same time that Cyrus was born, a son happened to be born also to the herder. When his wife learned that the king's child had been exposed, she urgently prayed for it to be brought to her, that she might look at it. Moved by her entreaties, the herder returned to the woods. There he found a bitch standing beside the child, giving it her teats, and keeping the beasts and birds away from it. At this aspect he was filled with the same compassion as the bitch. So that he picked up the boy and carried him home, the bitch following him in great distress. When his wife took the boy in her arms, he smiled at her as if he already knew her. And as he was very strong, and ingratiated himself with her by his pleasant smile, she voluntarily begged the herder to, expose her own child instead and, fifty-four permit her to raise the boy. 
be it that she was interested in his welfare, or that she placed her hopes on him. Thus the two boys had to exchange fates, one was raised in place of the herder's child, while the other was exposed instead of the grandson of the king. The remainder of this apparently more primitive report agrees essentially with the account of Herodotus. An altogether different version of the Cyrus myth is extant in the report of Tejas, a contemporary of Herodotus. The original of his narrative, which comprised more than an entire book in his Persian history, has been lost, but a surviving fragment of Nicholas of Damascus summarizes the Tejan account. Fifty-five Astyages is said to have been the worthiest king of the Medes, after Abakes. Under his rule occurred the great transmutation through which the rulership passed from the Medes to the Persians, in the following manner. The Medes had a law that a poor man who went to a rich man for his support, and surrendered himself to him, had to be fed and clothed and kept like a slave by the rich man, or in case the latter refused to do so, the poor man was at liberty to go elsewhere. In this way a boy by name of Cyrus, a marred by birth, came to the king's servant who was at the head of the palace sweepers. Cyrus was the son of Atridates, whose poverty made him live as a robber, and whose wife, Argost, Cyrus' mother, made her living by tending the goats. Cyrus surrendered himself for the sake of his daily bread, and helped to clean the palace. As he was diligent, the foreman gave him better clothing and advanced him from the outside sweepers to those who cleaned the interior of the king's palace, placing him under their superintendent. This man was severe, however, and often whipped Cyrus. The boy left him and went to the lamplighter, who liked Cyrus and moved him closer to the king, by placing him among the royal torchbearers. As Cyrus distinguished himself also in his new position, he came to Artembers, who was at the head of the cupbearers and himself presented the cup to the king. Artembers gladly accepted Cyrus, and bade him pour the wine for the guests at the king's table. Not long afterwards, Astyages noticed the dexterity and nimbleness of Cyrus' service, and his graceful presentation of the wine cup, so that he asked of Artembers whence this youth had come who was so skillful a cupbearer. O Lord, spake he, this boy is thy slave, of Persian parentage, from the tribe of the Mards, who has surrendered himself to me to make a living. Artembers was old, and once on being attacked by a fever, he prayed the king to let him stay at home until he had recovered. In my stead, the youth whom thou hast praised will pour the wine, and if he should please thee, the king, as a cupbearer, I who am a eunuch, will adopt him as my son. Astyages consented, but the other confided in many ways in Cyrus as in a son. Cyrus thus stood at the king's side, and poured his wine by day and by night, showing great ability and cleverness. Astyages conferred upon him the income of Artembers, as if he had been his son, adding many presents, and Cyrus became a great man whose name was heard everywhere. Astyages had a very noble and beautiful daughter, fifty-six whom he gave to the Medes Potamas, adding all media as her dowry. Then Cyrus sent for his father and mother, in the land of the Medes, and they rejoiced in the good fortune of their son, and his mother told him the dream which she had at the time that she was bearing him. While asleep in the sanctuary as she was tending the goats. So much water passed away from her that it became as a large stream, inundating all Asia, and flowing as far as the sea. When the father heard this, he ordered the dream to be placed before the Chaldeans in Babylon. Cyrus summoned the wisest among them, and communicated the dream to him. He declared that the dream foretold great good fortune to Cyrus, and the highest dignity in Asia. But Astyages must not learn of it, for else he would disgracefully kill thee, as well as myself the interpreter, said the Babylonian. They swore to each other to tell no one of this great and incomparable vision. Cyrus later on rose to still higher dignities, created his father a satrap of Persia, and raised his mother to the highest rank and possessions among the Persian women. But when the Babylonian was killed soon afterwards by Obers, the confidant of Cyrus, his wife betrayed the fateful dream to the king, when she learned of Cyrus' expedition to Persia, which he had undertaken in preparation of the revolt. The king sent his horsemen after Cyrus, with the command to deliver him dead or alive. But Cyrus escaped them by a ruse. Finally a combat took place, terminating in the defeat of the Medes. Cyrus also conquered Egbatana, 
and here the daughter of Astyage and her husband Spatamas, with their two sons, were taken prisoners. But Astyage himself could not be found, for Amitiz and Spatamas had concealed him in the palace, under the rafters of the roof. Cyrus then ordered that Amitiz, her husband, and the children should be tortured until they revealed the hiding place of Astyage, but he came out voluntarily, that his relatives might not be tortured on his account. Cyrus commanded the execution of Spatamas, because he had lied in affirming to be in ignorance of Astyage's hiding place, but Amitiz became the wife of Cyrus. He removed the fetters of Astyage, with which Oberes had bound him, honored him as a father, and made him a satrap of the Barcanians. A great similarity to Herodotus' version of the Cyrus myth is found in the early history of the Persian royal hero, Kaikisrauf, as related by Ferdowsi in the Shah Nama. This myth is most extensively rendered by Spiegel. 57 During the warfare of King Kaikaus, of Bactria and Iran, against King Afrasiab, of Tehran, Kaikaus fell out with his son, Syavaksh, who applied to Afrasiab for protection and assistance. He was kindly received by Afrasiab, who gave him his daughter Pharyngis to wife, on the persuasion of his vizier, Pyron, although he had received the prophecy that the son to be born of this union would bring great misfortune upon him. Garcevaz, the king's brother, and a near relative of Syavaksh, calumniates the son-in-law, and Afrasiab leads an army against him. Before the birth of his son, Syavaksh is warned by a dream, which foretold destruction and death to himself, but royalty to his offspring. He therefore flies from Afrasiab, but is taken prisoner and killed, on the command of the Shah. His wife, who is pregnant, is saved by Pyron from the hands of the murderers. On condition of announcing at once the delivery of Pharyngis to the king, Pyron is granted permission to keep her in his house. The shade of the murdered Syavaksh once comes to him in a dream and tells him that an avenger has been born, Pyron actually finds in the room of Pharyngis a newborn boy, whom he names Kaikisrav. Afrasiab no longer insisted upon the killing of the boy, but he ordered Pyron to surrender the child with a nurse to the herders, who were to raise him in ignorance of his origin. But his royal descent is promptly revealed in his courage and his demeanor, and as Pyron takes the boy back into his home, Afrasiab becomes distrustful, and orders the boy to be led before him. Instructed by Pyron, Kaikisrav plays the fool, 58 and reassured as to his harmlessness, the Shah dismisses him to his mother, Pharyngis. Finally, Kaikisrav is crowned as king by his grandfather, Kaikaus. After prolonged, complicated, and tedious combats, Afrasiab is at last taken prisoner, with divine assistance. Kaikisrav strikes his head off, and also causes Garcevaz to be decapitated. A certain resemblance to the preceding saga, although more remote, is presented by the myth of Faridun, as told by Ferdowsi.59 Zohak, the king of Iran, one sees in a dream three men of royal tribe. Two of them are bent with age, but between them is a younger man who holds a club, with a bull's head, in his right hand, this man steps up to him, and fells him with his club to the ground. The dream interpreters declared to the king that the young hero who will dethrone him is Faridun, a scion of the tribe of Tzkemshid. Zohak at once sets out to look for the tracks of his dreaded enemy. Faridun is the son of Abtin, a grandson of Tzkemshid. His father hides from the pursuit of the tyrant, but he is seized and killed. Faridun himself, a boy of tender age, is saved by his mother, Firinek, who escapes with him and entrusts him to the care of the guardian of a distant forest. Here he is suckled by a cow. For three years he remains hidden in this place, but then his mother no longer believes him safe, and she carries him to a hermit on Mount Elbers. Soon afterward Zohak comes to the forest and kills the guardian as well as the cow. When Faridun was sixteen years old, he came down from Mount Elbers, learned of his origin through his mother, and swore to avenge the death of his father and of his nurse. On the expedition against Zohak he is accompanied by his two older brothers, Permage and Kainosa. He orders a club to be forged for his use, and ornaments it with the bull's head, in memory of his foster mother, the cow. With this club he smites Zohak, as foretold by the dream. Tristan The theme of the Faridun story is pursued in the Tristan saga, 
as related in the epic poem by Gottfried von Strasberg. This is especially evident in the prologue of the Tristan saga, which is repeated later on in the adventures of the hero himself, duplication. Rivalin, king in the land of the Parmenians, in an expedition to the court of Mark, king of Cornwall and England, had become acquainted with the latter's beautiful sister, Blanchefleur, and his heart was aflame with love for her. While assisting Mark in a campaign, Rivalin was mortally wounded and was carried to Tintagel. Blanchefleur, disguised as a beggar maid, hastened to his sickbed, and her devoted love saved the king's life. She fled with her lover to his native land, Obstacles, and was there proclaimed as his consort. But Morgan attacked Rivalin's country, for the sake of Blanchefleur, whom the king entrusted to his faithful retainer Rual, because she was carrying a child. Rual placed the queen for safekeeping in the castle of Canile. Here she gave birth to a son and died, while her husband fell in the battle against Morgan. In order to protect the king's offspring from Morgan's pursuits, Rual spread the rumor that the infant had been born dead. The boy was named Tristan, because he had been conceived and born in sorrow. Under the care of his foster parents, Tristan grew up, equally straight in body and mind, until his fourteenth year, when he was kidnapped by Norwegian merchants, who then put him ashore in Cornwall because they feared the wrath of the gods. Here the boy was found by the soldiers of King Mark, who was so well pleased with the brave and handsome youth that he promptly made him his master of the chase, career, and held him in great affection. Meanwhile, faithful Rual had set forth to seek his abducted foster son, whom he found at last in Cornwall, where Rual had come begging his way. Rual revealed Tristan's descent to the king, who was delighted to see in him the son of his beloved sister, and raised him to the rank of knight. In order to avenge his father, Tristan proceeded with Rual to Parmenia, vanquished Morgan, the usurper, and gave the country to Rual as liege, while he himself returned to his uncle Mark. 60. The actual Tristan saga goes on with a repetition of the principal themes. In the service of Mark, Tristan kills Morald, the bridegroom of Isolde, and being wounded unto death, he is saved by Isolde. He asks her hand in marriage on behalf of his uncle Mark. When he fulfills the condition of killing a dragon, she accompanies him reluctantly to Cornwall, to which they travel by ship. On the journey they partake unwittingly of the disastrous love potion which binds them together in frenzied passion, they betray King Mark. On the wedding night, Isolde's faithful maid, Brangain, represents the queen, and sacrifices her virginity to the king. Next follows the banishment of Tristan, his several attempts to regain his beloved, although he had meanwhile married another Isolde, Isolde the White Hand, of Brittany, who resembled his love, Isolde the Fair. At last he is again wounded unto death, and Isolde arrives too late to save him. 61. A plainer version of the Tristan saga in the sense of the characteristic features of the myth of the birth of the hero is found in the fairy tale, The True Bride, quoted by Rick Lynn from Rittershaw's point 62 A royal pair have no children. The king having threatened to kill his wife unless she bears a child by the time of his return from his sea voyage, she is brought to him during his journey, by his zealous maidservant, as the fairest of three promenading ladies. And he takes her into his tent without recognizing her. 63 She returns home without having been discovered, gives birth to a daughter, Isil, and dies. Isil later on finds, in a box by the seaside, a most beautiful little boy, whose name is Tristram, and she raises him to become engaged to him. The subsequent story, which contains the motif of the true bride, is noteworthy for present purposes only in so far as here again occurs the draft of oblivion, and two Isoldas. The king's second wife gives a potion to Tristram, which causes him to forget the fair Isol entirely, so that he wishes to marry the black Isoda. Ultimately he discovers the deception, however, and becomes united with Isol. Romulus The original version of the story of Romulus and Remus as told by the most ancient Roman analyst Quintus Fabius Pictor is rendered as follows by Momsen, 64. The twins born by Ilia, the daughter of the preceding king Numitor. From the embrace of the war god Mars were condemned by King Emulius, the present ruler of Alba, to be cast into the river. The king's servants took the children and carried them from Alba as far as the Tiber on the Palatine Hill. 
but when they tried to descend the hill to the river, to carry out the command, they found that the river had risen, and they were unable to reach its bed. The tub with the children was therefore thrust by them into the shallow water at the shore. It floated for a while, but the water promptly receded, and knocking against a stone, the tub capsized, and the screaming infants were upset into the river mud. They were heard by a she-wolf who had just brought forth and had her udders full of milk, she came and gave her teats to the boys, to nurse them, and as they were drinking she licked them clean with her tongue. Above them flew a woodpecker, which guarded the children, and also carried food to them. The father was providing for his sons, for the wolf and the woodpecker are animals consecrated to Father Mars. This was seen by one of the royal herdsmen, who was driving his pigs back to the pasture from which the water had receded. Startled by the spectacle, he summoned his mates, who found the she-wolf attending like a mother to the children, and the children treated her as their mother. The men made a loud noise to scare the animal away, but the wolf was not afraid. She left the children, but not from fear, slowly, without heeding the herdsmen, she disappeared into the wilderness of the forest, at the holy site of Faunus, where the water gushes from a gully of the mountain. Meanwhile the men picked up the boys and carried them to the chief swineherd of the king, Faustulus, for they believed that the gods did not wish the children to perish. But the wife of Faustulus had just given birth to a dead child, and was full of sorrow. Her husband gave her the twins, and she nursed them, the couple raised the children, and named them Romulus and Remus. After Rome had been founded, later on, King Romulus built himself a house not far from the place where his tub had stood. The gully in which the she-wolf had disappeared has been known since that time as the wolf's gully, the Lupercal. The image in or of the she-wolf with the twins was subsequently erected at this spot 65 and the she-wolf herself, the Lupa, was worshipped by the Romans as a divinity. The Romulus saga later on underwent manifold transmutations, mutilations, additions, and interpretations. Point 66 It is best known in the form transmitted by Livy, I, 3ff. Where we learn something about the antecedents and subsequent fate of the twins. King Proca bequeaths the royal dignity to his firstborn son, Numitor. But his younger brother, Amulius, pushes him from the throne, and becomes king himself. So that no scion from Numitor's family may arise, as the avenger, he kills the male descendants of his brother. Rhea Silvia, the daughter, he elects as a vestal, and thus deprives her of the hope of progeny, through perpetual virginity as enjoined upon her under the semblance of a most honorable distinction. But the Vestal Maiden was overcome by violence, and having brought forth twins, she named Mars as the father of her illegitimate offspring, be it from conviction, or because a god appeared more creditable to her as the perpetrator of the crime. The narrative of the exposure in the Tiber goes on to relate that the floating tub, in which the boys had been exposed, was left on dry land by the receding waters, and that a thirsty wolf, attracted from the neighboring mountains by the children's cries, offered them her teats. The boys are said to have been found by the chief royal herder, supposedly named Faustulus, who took them to the homestead of his wife, Laurentia, where they were raised. Some believe that Laurentia was called Lupa, she-wolf, by the herders because she offered her body, and that this was the origin of the wonderful saga. Grown to manhood, the youths Romulus and Remus protect the herds against the attacks of wild animals and robbers. One day Remus is taken prisoner by the robbers, who accuse him of having stolen Numitor's flocks. But Numitor, to whom he is surrendered for punishment, was touched by his tender age, and when he learned of the twin brothers, he suspected that they might be his exposed grandsons. While he was anxiously pondering the resemblance with the features of his daughter, and the boy's age as corresponding to the time of the exposure, Faustulus arrived with Romulus. And a conspiracy was hatched when the descent of the boys had been learned from the herders. The youths armed themselves for vengeance, while Numitor took up weapons to defend his claim to the throne he had usurped. After Amulius had been assassinated, Numitor was reinstituted as the ruler, and the youths resolved to found a city in the region where they had been exposed and brought up. A furious dispute arose upon the question of which brother was to be the ruler of the newly erected city, for neither twin was favored by the right of primogeniture, and the outcome of the bird oracle was equally doubtful. 
The saga relates that Remus jumped over the new wall, to deride his twin, and Romulus became so much enraged that he slew his brother. Romulus then usurped the sole mastery, and the city was named Rome after him. The Roman tale of Romulus and Remus has a close counterpart in the Greek myth of a city foundation by the twin brothers Amphion and Zethus, who were the first to found the site of Thebes of the Seven Gates. The enormous rocks which Zethus brought from the mountains were joined by the music drawn from Amphion's lyre strings to form the walls which became so famous later on. Amphion and Zethus passed as the children of Zeus and Antiope, daughter of King Nycteus. She escaped by flight from the punishment of her father, who died of grief. On his deathbed he implored his brother and successor on the throne, Lycus, to punish the wrongdoing of Antiope. Meantime she had married Ipopius, the king of Sicyon, who was killed by Lycus. Antiope was led away by him in fetters. She gave birth to twin sons in the Scythian, where she left them. A shepherd raised the boys and called them Amphion and Zethus. Later on, Antiope succeeded in escaping from the torments of Lycus and his wife, Dersi. She accidentally sought shelter in the Scythian, with the twin brothers, now grown up. The shepherd reveals to the youths the fact that Antiope is their mother. Thereupon they cruelly kill Dersi, and deprive Lycus of the rulership. The remaining twin sagas, 67 which are extremely numerous, cannot be discussed in detail in this connection. Possibly they represent a complication of the birth myth by another very ancient and widely distributed myth complex, that of the hostile brothers, the detailed discussion of which belongs elsewhere. The apparently late and secondary character of the twin type in the birth myths justifies the separation of this part of mythology from the present theme. As regards the Romulus saga, Momsen considers it highly probable that it originally told only of Romulus, while the figure of Remus was added subsequently, and somewhat disjointedly. When it became desirable to invest the consulate with a solemnity founded on old tradition. 68. Hercules. After the loss of his numerous sons, Electrion betrothes his daughter, Alcmene, to Amphitryon, the son of his brother, Alcaeus. However, Amphitryon, through an unfortunate accident, causes the death of Electrion, and escapes to Thebes with his affianced bride. He has not enjoyed her love, for she has solemnly pledged him not to touch her until he has avenged her brothers on the Thebans. An expedition is therefore started by him, from Thebes, and he conquers the king of the hostile people, Terileos, with all the islands. As he is returning to Thebes, Zeus in the form of Amphitryon betakes himself to Alcmene, to whom he presents a golden goblet as evidence of victory. 69 He rests with the beauteous maiden during three nights, according to the later poets, holding back the sun one day. In the same night, Amphitryon arrives, exultant in his victory in a flame with love. In the fullness of time, the fruit of the divine and the human embrace is brought forth, and Zeus announces to the gods his son, as the most powerful ruler of the future. 70 But his jealous spouse, Hera, knows how to obtain from him the pernicious oath that the firstborn grandson of Perseus is to be the ruler of all the other descendants of Perseus. Hera hurries to Mycenae, to deliver the wife of Perseus' third son, Stenelos, of the seven months' child, Eurystheus. At the same time she hinders and endangers the confinement of Alcmene, through all sorts of wicked sorcery, precisely as at the birth of the god of light, Apollo. Alcmene finally gives birth to Hercules and Iphicles, the latter in no way the former's equal in courage or in strength, but destined to become the father of his faithful friend, Iolos. 71 In this way Eurystheus became the king in Mycenae, in the land of the Argolians, in conformity with the oath of Zeus, and the later-born Hercules was his subject. The old legend related the raising of Hercules on the strength-giving waters of the fountain of Dersi, the nourishment of all Theban children. Later on, however, another version arose. Fearing the jealousy of Hera, Alcmene exposed the child she had born in a place that for a long time after was known as the Field of Hercules. About this time, Athena arrived, in company with Hera. She marveled at the beautiful form of the child, and persuaded Hera to put him to her breast. But the boy took the breast with far greater strength than his age seemed to warrant, 
Hera felt pains and angrily flung the child to the ground. Athena, however, carried him to the neighboring city and took him to Queen Alcmene, whose maternity was unknown to her, as a poor foundling, whom she begged her to raise for the sake of charity. This peculiar accident is truly remarkable. The child's own mother allows him to perish, disregarding the duty of maternal love, and the stepmother, who is filled with natural hatred against the child, saves her enemy without knowing it. Seventy-two Hercules had drawn only a few drops from Hera's breast, but the divine milk was sufficient to endow him with immortality. An attempt on Hera's part to kill the boy, asleep in his cradle, by means of two serpents, proved a failure, for the child awakened and crushed the beasts with a single pressure of his hands. As a boy, Hercules one day killed his tutor, Linus, being incensed over an unjust chastisement. Amphitryon, fearing the wildness of the youth, sent him to tend his ox herds in the mountains, with the herders, among whom he is said by some to have been raised entirely, like Amphion and Zethus, Cyrus, and Romulus. Here he lives from the hunt, in the freedom of nature. Point seventy three. The myth of Hercules suggests in certain features the Hindu saga of the hero Krishna, who like many heroes escapes a general infanticide, and is then brought up by a herder's wife, Ayasada. A wicked she-demon appears, who has been sent by King Kansa to kill the boy. She takes the post of wet nurse in the home, but is recognized by Krishna, who bites her so severely in suckling like Hera, when nursing Hercules, whom she also means to destroy that she dies. Jesus. The Gospel according to Luke, 1 26 35, relates the prophecy of the birth of Jesus, as follows. And in the sixth month the angel Gabriel sent from God unto a city of Galilee, named Nazareth. To a virgin espoused to a man whose name was Joseph, of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And the angel came in unto her, and said, Hail! Thou that art highly favoured, the Lord is with thee, blessed art thou among women. And when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying, and cast in her mind what manner of salutation this should be. And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favour with God. And, behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and bring forth a son, and shalt call his name Jesus. He shall be great and shall be called the Son of the Highest, and the Lord God shalt give unto him the throne of his father David. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob for ever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. Then said Mary unto the angel, How shall this be, seeing I know not a man? And the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee, therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. This report is supplemented by the Gospel according to Matthew, 1 18 25, in the narrative of the birth and childhood of Jesus, 74. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise, when as his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph. Before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man, and not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privily. But, while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Now all this was done that it might be fulfilled which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is, God with us. Then Joseph being raised from sleep did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him and took unto him his wife, and knew her not till she had brought forth her firstborn son, and he called his name Jesus. Here we interpolate the detailed account of the birth of Jesus, from Gospel of Luke, 2 4 20. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, out of the city of Nazareth, into Judea, unto the city of David, which is called Bethlehem. Because he was of the house and lineage of David to be taxed with Mary his espoused wife, being great with child. And so it was, that, while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. 
And she brought forth her firstborn son, and wrapped him in swaddling clothes, and laid him in a manger, seventy-five because there was no room for them in the inn. And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flocks by night. And, lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for, behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Saviour, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. Ye shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God, and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, good will toward men. And it came to pass, as the angels were gone away from them into heaven, the shepherds said one to another, Let us now go even unto Bethlehem, and see this thing which has come to pass, which the Lord has made known unto us. And they came with haste, and found Mary, and Joseph, and the babe lying in a manger. And when they had seen it, they made known abroad the saying which was told them concerning this child. And all they that heard wondered at those things which were told them by the shepherds. But Mary kept all these things, and pondered them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things which they had heard and seen, as it was told unto them. We now continue the account after Matthew, in the second chapter. Now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east, and are come to worship him. When Herod the king had heard these things, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he demanded of them where Christ should be born. And they said unto him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet, And thou Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, art not the least among the princes of Judah, for out of thee shall come a governor, that shall rule my people Israel. Then Herod, when he had privily called the wise men, inquired of them diligently what time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem, and said, Go and search diligently for the young child. And when ye have found him, bring me word again, that I may come and worship him also. When they had heard the king, they departed. And, lo, the star, which they saw in the east, went before them, till it came and stood over where the young child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. And when they were come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary his mother, and fell down, and worshipped him, and when they had opened their treasures, they presented unto him gifts, gold, and frankincense, and myrrh. And being warned of God in a dream, that they should not return to Herod, they departed into their own country another way. And when they were departed, behold, the angel of the Lord appeareth to Joseph in a dream, saying, Arise, and take the young child and his mother, and flee into Egypt. And be thou there until I bring thee word, for Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. When he arose, he took the young child and his mother by night, and departed into Egypt, and was there until the death of Herod, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Out of Egypt have I called my son. Then Herod, when he saw that he was mocked of the wise men, was exceeding wroth, and sent forth, and slew all the children that were in Bethlehem, and in all the coasts thereof, from two years old and under. According to the time which he had diligently inquired of the wise men. But when Herod was dead, behold, an angel of the Lord appeareth in a dream to Joseph in Egypt, saying, Arise, and take the young child and his mother, and go into the land of Israel, for they are dead which sought the young child's life. And he arose, and took the young child and his mother, and came into the land of Israel. But when he heard Archelaus did reign in Judea in the room of his father Herod, he was afraid to go thither, notwithstanding, being warned of God in a dream. He turned aside into the parts of Galilee, and he came and dwelt in a city called Nazareth, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophets, he shall be called a Nazarene. 76. Similar birth legends to those of Jesus have also been transmitted of other founders of religions, such as Zoroaster, 
who is said to have lived about the year 1000 BC. His mother, Dugda, dreams, in the sixth month of her pregnancy, that the wicked and the good spirits are fighting for the embryonic Zoroaster, a monster tears the future Zoroaster from the mother's womb. But a light god fights the monster with his horn of light, re-encloses the embryo in the mother's womb, blows upon Dugda, and she becomes pregnant again. On awakening, she hurries in her fear to a wise dream interpreter, who is unable to explain the wonderful dream before the end of three days. He then declares that the child she is carrying is destined to become a man of great importance. The dark cloud and the mountain of light signify that she and her son will at first have to undergo numerous trials, through tyrants and other enemies, but at last they will overcome all perils. Dugda at once returns to her home and informs Purushakpa, her husband, of everything that has happened. Immediately after his birth, the boy was seen to laugh, this was the first miracle through which he drew attention to himself. The magicians announced the birth of the child as a portent of disaster to the prince of the realm, Durantsaran, who betakes himself without delay to the dwelling of Purushakpa, in order to stab the child. But his hand falls paralyzed, and he must leave with his errand undone, this was the second miracle. Soon after, the wicked demons steal the child from his mother and carry him into the desert, in order to kill him. But Dugda finds the unharmed child, calmly sleeping. This is the third miracle. Later on, Zoroaster was to be trampled upon, in a narrow passageway, by a herd of oxen, by command of the king. 77 But the largest of the cattle took the child between his feet and preserved it from harm. This was the fourth miracle. The fifth is merely a repetition of the preceding, what the cattle had refused to do, was to be accomplished by horses. But again the child was protected by a horse from the hoofs of the other horses. Durinsurin thereupon had the cubs in a wolf's den killed during the absence of the old wolves, and Zoroaster was laid down in their place. But a god closed the jaws of the furious wolves, so that they could not harm the child. Two divine cows arrived instead and presented their udders to the child, giving it to drink. This was the sixth miracle through which Zoroaster's life was preserved. 78. Related themes are also encountered in the history of Buddha, 6th century before Christ, such as the long sterility of the parents, the dream, the birth of the boy under the open sky. The death of the mother and her substitution by a foster mother, the announcing of the birth to the ruler of the realm, and later on the losing of the boy in the temple. 79. Siegfried. The Old Norse the Drexiga, as recorded about the year 1250 by an Icelander, according to oral traditions and ancient songs, relates the history of the birth and youth of Siegfried. 80 King Sigmund of Tarlungaland, on his return from an expedition, banishes his wife Sisibi, the daughter of King Nidung of Hispania, who is accused by Count Hartvin, whose advances she has spurned, of having had illicit relations with a menial. The king's counselors advise him to mutilate the innocent queen, instead of killing her, and Hartvin is ordered to cut out her tongue in the forest, so as to bring it to the king as a pledge. His companion, Count Hermann, opposes the execution of the cruel command, and proposes to present the tongue of a dog to the king. While the two men are engaged in a violent quarrel, Sisibi gives birth to a remarkably beautiful boy. She then took a glass vessel, and after having wrapped the boy in linens, she placed him in the glass vessel, which she carefully closed again and placed beside her. Count Hartvin was conquered in the fight, and in falling kicked the glass vessel, so that it fell into the river. When the queen saw this she swooned, and died soon afterwards. Hermann went home, told the king everything, and was banished from the country. The glass vessel meantime drifted downstream to the sea, and it was not long before the tide turned. Then the vessel floated onto a rocky cliff, and the water ran off so that the place where the vessel was was perfectly dry. The boy inside had grown somewhat, and when the vessel struck the rock, it broke, and the child began to cry. The boy's wailing was heard by a doe, which seized him with her lips, and carried him to her litter, where she nursed him together with her young. After the child had lived twelve months in the den of the doe, he had grown to the height and strength of other boys four years of age. One day he ran into the forest, where dwelt the wise and skillful smith Mimir, 
who had lived for nine years in childless wedlock. He saw the boy, who was followed by the faithful doe, took him to his home, and resolved to bring him up as his own son. He gave him the name of Siegfried. In Mimir's home, Siegfried soon attained an enormous stature and strength, but his willfulness caused Mimir to get rid of him. He sent the youth into the forest, where it had been arranged that the dragon begin, Mimir's brother, was to kill him. But Siegfried conquers the dragon, and kills Mimir. He then proceeds to Brunhild, who names his parents to him. Similar to the early history of Siegfried is an Austrasian saga that tells of the birth and youth of Wolf Dietrich. 81 His mother is likewise accused of unfaithfulness, and of intercourse with the devil, by a vassal whom she has repulsed, and who speaks evil of her to the returning king, Hug Dietrich of Constantinople. 82. The king surrenders the child to the faithful Birchtongue, who is to kill it, but exposes it instead in the forest, near the water, in the hope that it will fall in of its own accord and thus find its death. But the frolicking child remains unhurt, and even the wild animals lions, bears, and wolves, which come at night to the water do not harm it. The astonished Birchtongue resolves to save the boy, and he surrenders him to a gamekeeper who, together with his wife, raises him and names him Wolf Dietrich. 83. Three later hero epics may also be quoted in this connection, first, there is the 13th century French saga of Horn, the son of Aluf, who, after having been exposed on the sea, finally reaches the court of King Hunlaf. After numerous adventures, he wins the king's daughter, Rimhild, for his wife. Secondly, a detail suggestive of Siegfried appears in the saga of the skillful smith Wieland, who, after avenging his foully murdered father, floats down the river Weezer, artfully enclosed in the trunk of a tree, and loaded with the tools and treasures of his teachers. Finally, the King Arthur legend contains the commingling of divine and human paternity, the exposure, and the early life with a lowly man. Lohengrin The widely distributed group of sagas that have been woven around the mythical knight with the swan, the old French chevalier au signe, can be traced back to very ancient Celtic traditions. The following is the version which has been made familiar by Wagner's dramatization of this theme the story of Lohengrin, the knight with the swan. As transmitted by the medieval German epic, modernized by Junghaus, and briefly rendered by the Grimm brothers under the title, Lohengrin in Brabant. 84. The Duke of Brabant and Limburg died, without leaving other heirs than a young daughter, Els, or Elsa by name her he recommended on his deathbed to one of his retainers, Friedrich von Telramund. Friedrich, the intrepid warrior, became emboldened to demand the youthful duchess hand and lands, under the false claim that she had promised to marry him. She steadfastly refused to do so. Friedrich complained to Emperor Henry I, the Fowler, and the verdict was that she must defend herself against him, through some hero, in a so-called divine judgment, in which God would accord the victory to the innocent, and defeat the guilty. As none were ready to take her part, the young duchess prayed ardently to God to save her, and far away in distant Montsalvich, in the council of the Grail, the sound of the bell was heard, showing that there was someone in urgent need of help. The Grail therefore resolved to dispatch as a rescuer, Lohengrin, the son of Parsifal. Just as he was about to place his foot in the stirrup a swan came floating down the water drawing a skiff behind him. As soon as Lohengrin set eyes upon the swan, he exclaimed, Take the steed back to the manger, I shall follow this bird wherever he may lead me. Having faith in God's omnipotence, he took no food with him in the skiff. After they had been afloat five days, the swan dipped his bill in the water, caught a fish, ate one half of it, and gave the other half to the prince to eat. Thus the knight was fed by the swan. Meanwhile Elsa had summoned her chieftains and retainers to a meeting in Antwerp. Precisely on the day of the assembly, a swan was sighted swimming upstream, River Skelt, and drawing behind him a skiff, in which Lohengrin lay asleep on his shield. The swan promptly came to land at the shore, and the prince was joyfully welcomed. Hardly had his helmet, shield, and sword been taken from the skiff, when the swan at once swam away again. Lohengrin heard of the wrong which had been done to the duchess and willingly consented to become her champion. Elsa then summoned all her relatives and subjects. 
a place was prepared in Mainz for Lohengrin and Friedrich to fight in the Emperor's presence. The hero of the Grail defeated Friedrich, who confessed having lied to the Duchess, and was executed with the axe. Elsa was awarded to Lohengrin, they having long been lovers. But he secretly insisted upon her avoiding all questions as to his ancestry, or whence he had come, saying that otherwise he would have to leave her instantaneously and she would never see him again. For some time, the couple lived in peace and happiness. Lohengrin was a wise and mighty ruler over his land, and also served his emperor well in his expeditions against the Huns and the heathen. But it came to pass that one day in throwing the javelin he unhorsed the Duke of Cleve, so that the latter broke an arm. The Duchess of Cleve was angry, and spoke out amongst the women, saying, Lohengrin may be brave enough, and he seems to be a good Christian. What a pity that his nobility is not of much account for no one knows whence he has come floating to this land. These words pierced the heart of the Duchess of Brabant, and she changed color with emotion. At night, when her spouse was holding her in his arms, she wept, and he said, What is the matter, Elsa, my own? She made answer, The Duchess of Cleve has caused me sore pain. Lohengrin was silent and asked no more. The second night, the same came to pass. But in the third night, Elsa could no longer retain herself, and she spoke, Lord, do not chide me. I wish to know, for our children's sake, whence you were born. For my heart tells me that you are of high rank. When the day broke, Lohengrin declared in public whence he had come, that Parsifal was his father, and God had sent him from the grail. He then asked for his two children, which the Duchess had borne him, kissed them, told them to take good care of his horn and sword, which he would leave behind, and said, Now, I must be gone. To the Duchess he left a little ring which his mother had given him. Then the swan, his friend, Karn swimming swiftly, with the skiff behind him, the prince stepped in and crossed the water, back to the service of the grail. Elsa sank down in a faint. The empress resolved to keep the younger boy Lohengrin, for his father's sake, and to bring him up as her own child. But the widow wept and mourned the rest of her life for her beloved spouse, who never came back to her. 85. On inverting the Lohengrin saga in such a way that the end is placed first on the basis of the rearrangement, or even transmutation of motifs. Not uncommonly found in myths we find the type of saga with which we have now become familiar, the infant Lohengrin, who is identical with his father of the same name, floats in a vessel upon the sea and is carried ashore by a swan. The empress adopts him as her son, and he becomes a valorous hero. Having married a noble maiden of the land, he forbids her to inquire as to his origin. When the command is broken he is obliged to reveal his miraculous descent and divine mission, after which the swan carries him back in his skiff to the grail. Other versions of the saga of the knight with the swan have retained this original arrangement of the motifs, although they appear commingled with elements of fairy tales. The saga of the knight with the swan, as related in the Flemish People's Book 86 contains in the beginning the history of the birth of seven children 87 born by Beatrix, the wife of King Orient of Flanders. Matabruna, the wicked mother of the absent king, orders that the children be killed and the queen be given seven puppy dogs in their stead. But the servant contents himself with the exposure of the children, who are found by a hermit named Helios, and are nourished by a goat until they are grown. Beatrix is thrown into a dungeon. Later on, Matabruna learns that the children have been saved, her repeated command to kill them causes her hunter to bring her as a sign of apparent obedience the silver neck chains which the children already wore at the time of their birth. One of the boys named Helios, after his foster father alone keeps his chain, and is thereby saved from the fate of his brothers, who are transformed into swans as soon as their chains are removed. Matabruna volunteers to prove the relations of the queen with the dog, and upon her instigation, Beatrix is to be killed, unless a champion arises to defend her. In her need, she prays to God, who sends her son Helios as a rescuer. The brothers are also saved by means of the other chains, except one, whose chain has already been melted down. King Orient now transfers the rulership to his son Helios, who causes the wicked Matabruna to be burned. One day, Helias sees his brother, the swan, 
drawing a skiff on the lake surrounding the castle. This he regards as a heavenly sign, he arms himself and mounts the skiff. The swan takes him through rivers and lakes to the place where God has ordained him to go. Next follows the liberation of an innocently accused duchess, in analogy with the Lohengrin saga. And his marriage to her daughter Clarissa, who is forbidden to ask about her husband's ancestry. In the seventh year of their marriage she disobeys and puts the question, after which Helios returns home in the swan's skiff. Finally, his lost brother Swan is likewise released. The characteristic features of the Lohengrin saga the disappearance of the divine hero in the same mysterious fashion in which he has arrived. The transference of mythical motifs from the life of the older hero to a younger one bearing the same name, a universal process in myth formation, are likewise embodied in the Anglo-Lombard saga of Seif, who reappears in the prelude to the Anglo-Saxon Beowulf, the oldest Teutonic epic. Here, he is called Scyld the Seafung, meaning, son of Seif, and his origin as a foundling is referred to. The older legend tells that he received his name because as a very young boy he was cast ashore, as a stranger, asleep in a boat on a sheaf of grain, Anglo-Saxon, Seif. The waves of the sea carried him to the coast of the country he was destined to defend. The inhabitants welcomed his arrival as a miracle, raised him, and later on made him their king, considering him a divine emissary. 88 What was told of the father now is transferred in the Beowulf epic to his son, also called Scyl de.89 His body is exposed, as he had ordered before his death, surrounded by kingly splendor, upon a ship without a crew, which is sent out into the sea. Thus he vanished in the same mysterious manner in which his father arrived ashore, this trait being accounted for, in analogy with the Lohengrin saga, by the mythical identity of father and son. The Interpretation of the Myths A cursory review of these variegated hero myths forcibly brings out a series of uniformly common features, with a typical groundwork, from which a standard saga, as it were, may be constructed. This schedule corresponds approximately to the ideal human skeleton that is constantly seen, with minor deviations, on transillumination of figures that outwardly differ from one another. The individual traits of the several myths, and especially the apparently crude variations from the prototype, can be entirely elucidated only by myth interpretation. The standard saga itself may be formulated according to the following outline. The hero is the child of most distinguished parents, usually the son of a king. His origin is preceded by difficulties, such as continence, or prolonged barrenness, or secret intercourse of the parents due to external prohibition or obstacles. During or before the pregnancy, there is a prophecy, in the form of a dream or oracle, cautioning against his birth, and usually threatening danger to the father, or his representative. As a rule, he is surrendered to the water, in a box. He is then saved by animals, or by lowly people, shepherds, and is suckled by a female animal or by an humble woman. After he has grown up, he finds his distinguished parents, in a highly versatile fashion. He takes his revenge on his father, on the one hand, and is acknowledged, on the other. Finally he achieves rank and honors. 90. Since the normal relations of the hero toward his father and his mother regularly appear impaired in all these myths, as shown by the outline, there is reason to assume that something in the nature of the hero must account for such a disturbance, and motives of this kind are not very difficult to discover. It is readily understood and may be noted in the modern imitations of the heroic age that for the hero, who is exposed to envy, jealousy, and calumny to a much higher degree than all others. The descent from his parents often becomes the source of the greatest distress and embarrassment. The old saying that, a prophet is not without honor, save in his own country and in his father's house, has no other meaning but that he whose parents, brothers and sisters, or playmates, are known to us, is not so readily conceded to be a prophet. There seems to be a certain necessity for the prophet to deny his parents, the well-known Meyerbeer opera is based upon the avowal that the prophetic hero is allowed, in favor of his mission, to abandon and repudiate even his tenderly loving mother. A number of difficulties arise, however, as we proceed to a deeper inquiry into the motives which obliged the hero to sever his family relations. 
numerous investigators have emphasized that the understanding of myth formation requires our going back to their ultimate source, namely the individual faculty of imagination. 91 The fact has also been pointed out that this imaginative faculty is found in its active and unchecked exuberance only in childhood. Therefore, the imaginative life of the child should first be studied, in order to facilitate the understanding of the far more complex and also more handicapped mythological and artistic imagination in general. Meanwhile, the investigation of the juvenile faculty of imagination has hardly commenced, instead of being sufficiently advanced to permit the utilization of the findings for the explanation of the more complicated psychic activities. The reason for this imperfect understanding of the psychic life of the child is traceable to the lack of a suitable instrument, as well as of a reliable avenue, leading into the intricacies of this very delicate and rather inaccessible domain. These juvenile emotions can by no means be studied in the normal human adult, and it may actually be charged, in view of certain psychic disturbances. That the normal psychic integrity of normal subjects consists precisely in their having overcome and forgotten their childish vagaries and imaginations. So that the way has become blocked. In children, on the other hand, empirical observation, which as a rule must remain merely superficial, fails in the investigation of psychic processes because we are not as yet enabled to trace all manifestations correctly to their motive forces. So that we are lacking the instrument. There is a certain class of persons, the so-called psychoneurotics, shown by the teachings of Freud to have remained children, in a sense, although otherwise appearing grown up. These psychoneurotics may be said not to have given up their juvenile psychic life, which on the contrary, in the course of maturity has become strengthened and fixed, instead of modified. In psychoneurotics, the emotions of the child are preserved and exaggerated, thus becoming capable of pathological effects, in which these humble emotions appear broadened and enormously magnified. The fancies of neurotics are, as it were, the uniformly exaggerated reproductions of the childish imaginings. This would point the way to a solution of the problem. Unfortunately, however, access is still much more difficult to establish in these cases than to the child mind. There is only one known instrument which makes this road practicable, namely the psychoanalytic method, which has been developed through the work of Freud. Constant handling of this instrument will clear the observer's vision to such a degree that he will be enabled to discover the identical motive forces, only in delicately shaded manifestations. Also in the psychic life of those who do not become neurotics later on. Professor Freud had the kindness to place at the author's disposal his valuable experience with the psychology of the neuroses. And on this material are based the following comments on the imaginative faculty of the child as well as of the neurotic. The detachment of the growing individual from the authority of the parents is one of the most necessary, but also one of the most painful achievements of evolution. It is absolutely necessary for this detachment to take place, and it may be assumed that all normal grown individuals have accomplished it to a certain extent. Social progress is essentially based upon this opposition between the two generations. On the other hand, there exists a class of neurotics whose condition indicates that they have failed to solve this very problem. For the young child, the parents are, in the first place, the sole authority and the source of all faith. To resemble them, i.e., the progenitor of the same sex to grow up like father or mother this is the most intense and portentous wish of the child's early years. Progressive intellectual development naturally brings it about that the child gradually becomes acquainted with the category to which the parents belong. Other parents become known to the child, who compares these with his own, and thereby becomes justified in doubting the incomparability and uniqueness with which he had invested them. Trifling occurrences in the life of the child, which induce a mood of dissatisfaction, lead up to a criticism of the parents. And the gathering conviction that other parents are preferable in certain ways is utilized for this attitude of the child toward the parents. From the psychology of the neurosis, we have learned that very intense emotions of sexual rivalry are also involved in this connection. The causative factor evidently is the feeling of being neglected. Opportunities arise only too frequently when the child is neglected, or at least feels himself neglected, when he misses the entire love of the parents, or at least regrets having to share this with the other children of the family. 
the feeling that one's own inclinations are not entirely reciprocated seeks its relief in the idea often consciously remembered from very early years of being a stepchild, or an adopted child. Many persons who have not become neurotics very frequently remember occasions of this kind, when the hostile behavior of the parents was interpreted and reciprocated by them in this fashion, usually under the influence of storybooks. The influence of sex is already evident, in so far as the boy shows a far greater tendency to harbor hostile feelings against his father than his mother, with a much stronger inclination to emancipate himself from the father than from the mother. The imaginative faculty of girls is possibly much less active in this respect. These consciously remembered psychic emotions of the years of childhood supply the factor which permits the interpretation of the myth. What is not often consciously remembered, but can almost invariably be demonstrated through psychoanalysis, is the next stage in the development of this incipient alienation from the parents. Which may be designated by the term, family romance of neurotics. The essence of neurosis, and of all higher mental qualifications, comprises a special activity of the imagination that is primarily manifested in the play of the child. And which from about the period preceding puberty takes hold of the theme of the family relations. A characteristic example of this special imaginative faculty is represented by the familiar daydreams, 92 which are continued until long after puberty. Accurate observation of these daydreams shows that they serve for the fulfillment of wishes, for the writing of life, and that they have two essential objects, one erotic. The other of an ambitious nature, usually with the erotic factor concealed therein. About the time in question, the child's imagination is engaged upon the task of getting rid of the parents, who are now despised and are as a rule to be supplanted by others of a higher social rank. The child utilizes an accidental coincidence of actual happenings, meetings with the lord of the manor or the proprietor of the estate, in the country, with the reigning prince, in the city. In the United States, with some great statesman or millionaire. Accidental occurrences of this kind arouse the child's envy, and this finds its expression in fancy fabrics which replace the two parents by others of a higher rank. The technical elaboration of these two imaginings, which of course by this time have become conscious, depends upon the child's adroitness and also upon the material at his disposal. It is likewise a factor whether these fancies are elaborated with more or less claim to plausibility. This stage is reached at a time when the child is still lacking all knowledge of the sexual conditions of descent. With the added knowledge of the manifold sexual relations of father and mother with the child's realization of the fact that the father is always uncertain. Whereas the mother is very certain the family romance undergoes a peculiar restriction, it is satisfied with ennobling the father, while the descent from the mother is no longer questioned, but accepted as an unalterable fact. This second, or sexual, stage of the family romance is moreover supported by another motive, which did not exist in the first, or asexual, stage. Knowledge of sexual matters gives rise to the tendency to picture erotic situations and relations, impelled by the pleasurable emotion of placing the mother, or the subject of the greatest sexual curiosity. In the situation of secret unfaithfulness and clandestine love affairs. In this way the primary or asexual fantasies are raised to the standard of the improved later understanding. The motive of revenge and retaliation, which was originally to the front, is again evident. These neurotic children are mostly those who were punished by the parents to break them of bad sexual habits, and they take their revenge upon their parents by their imaginings. The younger children of a family are particularly inclined to deprive their predecessors of their advantage by fables of this kind, exactly as in the intrigues of history. Frequently they do not hesitate in crediting the mother with as many love affairs as there are rivals. An interesting variation of this family romance restores the legitimacy of the plotting hero himself, while the other children are disposed of in this way as illegitimate. The family romance may be governed besides by a special interest, all sorts of inclinations being met by its adaptability and variegated character. The little romancer gets rid in this fashion, for example, of the kinship of a sister who may have attracted him sexually. Those who turn aside with horror from this corruption of the child mind, 
or perhaps actually contest the possibility of such matters, should note that all these apparently hostile imaginings have not such a very bad significance after all. And that the original affection of the child for his parents is still preserved under their thin disguise. The faithlessness and ingratitude on the part of the child are only apparent, for on investigating in detail the most common of these romantic fancies the substitution of both parents, or of the father alone. By more exalted personages the discovery will be made that these new and highborn parents, are invested throughout with the qualities which are derived from real memories of the true lowly parents. So that the child does not actually remove his father but exalts him. The entire endeavor to replace the real father by a more distinguished one is merely the expression of the child's longing for the vanished happy time, when his father still appeared to be the strongest and greatest man. And the mother seemed the dearest and most beautiful woman. The child turns away from the father, as he now knows him, to the father in whom he believed in his earlier years, his imagination being in truth only the expression of regret for this happy time having passed away. Thus the overvaluation of the earliest years of childhood again claims its own in these fancies. Point 93 An interesting contribution to this subject is furnished by the study of dreams. Dream interpretation teaches that even in later years, in the dreams of the emperor or the empress, these princely persons stand for the father and the mother. 94 Thus the infantile overvaluation of the parents is still preserved in the dream of the normal adult. As we proceed to fit the above features into our scheme, we feel justified in analogizing the ego of the child with the hero of the myth, in view of the unanimous tendency of family romances and hero myths. Keeping in mind that the myth throughout reveals an endeavor to get rid of the parents, and that the same wish arises in the fantasies of the individual child at the time when he is trying to establish his personal independence. The ego of the child behaves in this respect like the hero of the myth, and as a matter of fact, the hero should always be interpreted merely as a collective ego, which is equipped with all the excellences. In a similar manner, the hero in personal poetic fiction usually represents the poet himself, or at least one side of his character. Summarizing the essentials of the hero myth, we find the descent from noble parents, the exposure in a river, and in a box, and the raising by lowly parents. Followed in the further evolution of the story by the hero's return to his first parents, with or without punishment meted out to them. It is very evident that the two parent couples of the myth correspond to the real and the imaginary parent couple of the romantic fantasy. Closer inspection reveals the psychological identity of the humble and the noble parents, precisely as in the infantile and neurotic fantasies. In conformity with the overvaluation of the parents in early childhood, the myth begins with the noble parents, exactly like the romantic fantasy, whereas in reality adults soon adapt themselves to the actual conditions. Thus the fantasy of the family romance is simply realized in the myth, with a bold reversal to the actual conditions. The hostility of the father, and the resulting exposure, accentuate the motive which has caused the ego to indulge in the entire fiction. The fictitious romance is the excuse, as it were, for the hostile feelings which the child harbors against his father, and which in this fiction are projected against the father. The exposure in the myth, therefore, is equivalent to the repudiation or non-recognition in the romantic fantasy. The child simply gets rid of the father in the neurotic romance, while in the myth the father endeavors to lose the child. Rescue and revenge are the natural terminations, as demanded by the essence of the fantasy. In order to establish the full value of this parallelization, as just sketched in its general outlines, it must enable us to interpret certain constantly recurring details of the myth which seem to require a special explanation. This demand would seem to acquire special importance in view of the fact that no satisfactory explanation of these details is forthcoming in the writings of even the most enthusiastic astral mythologists or natural philosophers. Such details are represented by the regular occurrence of dreams, or oracles, and by the mode of exposure in a box and in the water. These motifs do not at first glance seem to permit a psychological derivation. Fortunately the study of dream symbolisms permits the elucidation of these elements of the hero myth. 
The utilization of the same material in the dreams of healthy persons and neurotics 95 indicates that the exposure in the water signifies no more and no less than the symbolic expression of birth, the children come out of the water. 96 The basket, box, or receptacle simply means the container, the womb, 97 so that the exposure directly signifies the process of birth, although it is represented by its opposite. Those who object to this representation by opposites should remember how often the dream works with the same mechanism. 98 A confirmation of this interpretation of the exposure, as taken from the common human symbolism, is furnished by the material itself. In the dream by the grandfather, or still more convincingly by the mother herself, 99 in the Tesian version of Cyrus before his birth. In this dream, so much water flows from the lap of the expectant mother as to inundate all Asia, like an enormous ocean. Point 100 It is remarkable that in both cases the Chaldeans correctly interpreted these water dreams as birth dreams. In all probability, these dreams themselves are constructed out of the knowledge of a very ancient and universally understood symbolism, with a dim foresight of the relations and connections which are appreciated and presented in Freud's teachings. There he says, in referring to a dream in which the dreamer hurls herself into the dark water of a lake, dreams of this sort are birth dreams, and their interpretation is accomplished by reversing the fact as communicated in the manifest dream. Namely, instead of hurling oneself into the water, it means emerging from the water, i.e., to be born. 101 The justice of this interpretation, which renders the water dream equivalent to the exposure, is again confirmed by the fact that precisely in the Cyrus saga, which contains the water dream, the theme of the exposure in the water is lacking. While only the basket, which does not occur in the dream, plays a part in the exposure. In this interpretation of the exposure as the birth, we must not let ourselves be disturbed by the discrepancy between the succession of the individual elements of the symbolized materialization and the real birth process. This chronological rearrangement or even reversal has been explained by Freud as due to the general manner in which recollections are elaborated into fantasies. The same material reappears in the fantasies, but in an entirely novel arrangement, and no attention whatsoever is paid to the natural sequence of the acts. 102. Besides this chronological reversal, the reversal of the contents requires special explanation. The first reason for the representation of the birth by its opposite the life-threatening exposure in the water is the accentuation of the parental hostility toward the future hero. 103 The creative influence of this tendency to represent the parents as the first and most powerful opponents of the hero will be appreciated when it is kept in mind that the entire family romance in general owes its origin to the feeling of being neglected namely. The assumed hostility of the parents. In the myth, this hostility goes so far that the parents refuse to let the child be born, which is precisely the reason of the hero's lament. Moreover, the myth plainly reveals the desire to enforce his materialization even against the will of the parents. The vital peril, thus concealed in the representation of birth through exposure, actually exists in the process of birth itself. The overcoming of all these obstacles also expresses the idea that the future hero has actually overcome the greatest difficulties by virtue of his birth, for he has victoriously thwarted all attempts to prevent it. 104 or another interpretation may be admitted, according to which the youthful hero, foreseeing his destiny to taste more than his share of the bitterness of life, deplores in a pessimistic mood the inimical act which has called him to earth. He accuses the parents, as it were, for having exposed him to the struggle of life, for having allowed him to be born. 105 The refusal to let the son be born, which belongs especially to the father, is frequently concealed by the contrast motif, the wish for a child, as in Oedipus, Perseus, and others. While the hostile attitude toward the future successor on the throne and in the kingdom is projected to the outside it is attributed to an oracular verdict, which is thereby revealed as the substitute of the ominous dream, or better, as the equivalent of its interpretation. From another point of view, however, the family romance shows that the fantasies of the child, although apparently estranging the parents, have nothing else to say concerning them besides their confirmation as the real parents. The exposure myth, translated with the assistance of symbolism, likewise contains nothing but the assurance, this is my mother, who has borne me at the command of the father. 
But on account of the tendency of the myth, and the resulting transference of the hostile attitude from the child to the parents, this assurance of the real parentage can only be expressed as the repudiation of such parentage. On closer inspection, it is noteworthy in the first place that the hostile attitude of the hero toward his parents concerns especially the father. Usually, as in the myth of Oedipus, Paris, and others, the royal father receives a prophecy of some disaster, threatening him through the expected son. Then it is the father who causes the exposure of the boy and who pursues and menaces him in all sorts of ways after his unlooked for rescue, but finally succumbs to his son, according to the prophecy. In order to understand this trait, which at first may appear somewhat startling, it is not necessary to explore the heavens for some process into which this trait might be laboriously fitted. Looking with open eyes and unprejudiced minds at the relations between parents and children, or between brothers, as these exist in reality 106 a certain tension is frequently, if not regularly revealed between father and son, or still more distinctly a competition between brothers. Although this tension may not be obvious and permanent, it is lurking in the sphere of the unconscious, as it were, with periodic eruptions. Erotic factors are especially apt to be involved, and as a rule the deepest, generally unconscious root of the dislike of the son for the father, or of two brothers for each other, is related to be competition for the tender devotion and love of the mother. The Oedipus myth shows plainly, only in grosser dimensions, the accuracy of this interpretation, for the parricide is here followed by the incest with the mother. This erotic relation with the mother, which predominates in other mythological cycles, is relegated to the background in the myths of the birth of the hero, while the opposition against the father is more strongly accentuated. 107. The fact that this infantile rebellion against the father is apparently provoked in the birth myths by the hostile behavior of the father, is due to a reversal of the relation, known as projection which is brought about by very peculiar characteristics of the myth-forming psychic activity. The projection mechanism which also bore its part in the reinterpretation of the birth act, as well as certain other characteristics of myth-formation. To be discussed presently necessitates the uniform characterization of the myth as a paranoid structure, in view of its resemblance to peculiar processes in the mechanism of certain psychic disturbances. Intimately connected with the paranoid character is the property of separating or dissociating what is fused in the imagination. This process, as illustrated by the two parent couples, provides the foundation for the myth formation. And together with the projection mechanism supplies the key to the understanding of an entire series of otherwise inexplicable configurations of the myth. As the motor power for this projection of the hero's hostile attitude onto the father, there stands revealed the wish for its justification, arising from the troublesome realization of these feelings against the father. The displacement process that begins with the projection of the troublesome sensation is still further continued, however, and with the assistance of the mechanism of separation or dissociation. It has found a different expression of its gradual progress in very characteristic forms of the hero myth. In the original psychologic setting, the father is still identical with the king, the tyrannical persecutor. The first attenuation of this relation is manifested in those myths in which the separation of the tyrannical persecutor from the real father is already attempted, but not yet entirely accomplished, the former being still related to the hero. Usually as his grandfather, for example in the Cyrus myth with all its versions, and in the majority of all hero myths in general. In the separation of the father's part from that of the king, this type signifies the first return step of the descent fantasy toward the actual conditions, and accordingly the hero's father appears in this type mostly as a lowly man, see Cyrus, Gilgamesh, and others. The hero thus arrives again at an approach toward his parents, the establishment of a certain kinship, which finds its expression in the fact that not only the hero himself, but also his father and his mother represent objects of the tyrant's persecution. The hero in this way acquires a more intimate connection with the mother they are often exposed together, Perseus, Telephus, Feridon, who is nearer to him on account of the erotic relation. While the renouncement of his hatred against the father here attains the expression of its most forcible reaction 108 for the hero henceforth appears, as in the Hamlet saga. Not as the persecutor of his father, or grandfather, but as the avenger of the persecuted father. 
This involves a deeper relation of the Hamlet saga with the Persian story of Kaikisrav, where the hero likewise appears as the avenger of his murdered father, compare Feridun and others. The person of the grandfather himself, who in certain sagas appears replaced by other relatives, the uncle, in the Hamlet saga, also possesses a deeper meaning. 109 The myth complex of the incest with the mother and the related revolt against the father is here combined with the second great complex, which has for its contents the erotic relations between father and daughter. Under this heading belongs, besides other widely ramified groups of sagas, 110 the story which is told in countless versions of a newborn boy, of whom it is prophesied that he is to become the son-in-law and heir of a certain ruler or potentate and who finally does so in spite of all persecutions, exposure and so forth, on the part of the latter. 111 The father who refuses to give his daughter to any of her suitors, or who attaches to the winning of the daughter certain conditions difficult of fulfillment, does this because he really begrudges her to all others. For when all is told he wishes to possess her himself. He locks her up in some inaccessible spot, so as to safeguard her virginity, Perseus, Gilgamesh, Telephus, Romulus, and when his command is disobeyed he pursues the daughter and her offspring with insatiable hatred. However, the unconscious sexual motives of his hostile attitude, which is later on avenged by his grandson, render it evident that again the hero kills in him simply the man who is trying to rob him of the love of his mother, namely, the father. Another attempt at a reversal to a more original type consists in the following theme, the return to the lowly father, which has been brought about through the separation of the father's role from that of the king, is again nullified through the lowly father's secondary elevation to the rank of a god, as in Perseus and the other sons of virgin mothers, Karna, Ion, Romulus, Jesus. The secondary character of this godly paternity is especially evident in those myths where the virgin who has been impregnated by divine conception later on marries a mortal, Jesus, Karna, Ion, who then appears as the real father. While the god as the father represents merely the most exalted childish idea of the magnitude, power, and perfection of the father. 112 At the same time, these myths strictly insist upon the motif of the virginity of the mother, which elsewhere is merely hinted at. The first impetus is perhaps supplied by the transcendental tendency, necessitated through the introduction of the god. At the same time, the birth from the virgin is the most abrupt repudiation of the father, the consummation of the entire myth, as illustrated by the Sargon legend, which does not admit any father besides the Vestal Mother. The last stage of this progressive attenuation of the hostile relation to the father is represented by that form of the myth in which the person of the royal persecutor not only appears entirely detached from that of the father, but has even lost the remotest kinship with the hero's family, which he opposes in the most hostile manner, as its enemy, in Feridun, Abraham, King Herod against Jesus, and others. Although of his original threefold character as the father, the king, and the persecutor, he retains only the part of the royal persecutor or the tyrant. The entire plan of the myth conveys the impression that nothing had been changed as if the designation father had been simply replaced by the term tyrant. This interpretation of the father as a tyrant which is typical of the infantile ideation 113 will be found later on to possess the greatest importance for the interpretation of certain abnormal constellations of this complex. The prototype of this identification of the king with the father, which regularly recurs also in the dreams of adults, presumably is the origin of royalty from the patriarchate in the family. Which is still attested by the use of identical words for king and father, in the Indo-Germanic languages, compare the German Landesvater, father of his country, equals king. 114 The reversal of the family romance to actual conditions is almost entirely accomplished in this type of myth. The lowly parents are acknowledged with a frankness which seems to be directly contradictory to the tendency of the entire myth. Precisely this revelation of the real conditions, which hitherto had to be left to the interpretation, enables us to prove the accuracy of the latter from the material itself. The biblical legend of Moses has been selected as especially well adapted to this purpose. Briefly summarizing the outcome of the previous interpretation mechanism, to make matters plainer, we find the two parent couples to be identical. After their splitting into the personalities of the father and the tyrannical persecutor has been connected the highborn parents are the echo, 
as it were, of the exaggerated notions the child originally harbored concerning his parents. The Moses legend actually shows the parents of the hero divested of all prominent attributes, they are simple people, devotedly attached to the child, and incapable of harming him. Meanwhile, the assertion of tender feelings for the child is a confirmation, here as well as everywhere, of the bodily parentage, compare the overseer in the Gilgamesh legend, the charioteer in the story of Karna, the fisherman in the Perseus myth. Etc. The amicable utilization of the exposure motif, which occurs in this type of myth, is referable to such a relationship. The child is surrendered in a basket to the water, but not with the object of killing him, as, for example, the hostile exposure of Oedipus and many other heroes, but for the purpose of saving him, compare also Abraham's early history, page 17. The danger fraught warning to the exalted father becomes a hopeful prophecy for the lowly father compare, in the birth story of Jesus. The oracle for Herod and Joseph's dream, entirely corresponding to the expectations placed by most parents in the career of their offspring. Retaining from the original tendency of, the romance the fact that Pharaoh's daughter drew the child from the water, i.e. gave it birth, the outcome is the familiar theme, grandfather type, of the king whose daughter is to bear a son, but who, on being warned by the ill omened interpretation of a dream, resolves to kill his forthcoming grandson. The handmaiden of his daughter, who in the biblical story draws the box from the water at the behest of the princess, is charged by the king with the exposure of the newborn child in a box, in the waters of the river Nile. That it may perish, the exposure motif, from the viewpoint of the highborn parents, here appearing in its original disastrous significance. The box with the child is then found by lowly people, and the poor woman raises the child, as his wet nurse, when he is grown up, he is recognized by the princess as her son. Just as in the prototype, the fantasy concludes with the recognition by the highborn parents. If the Moses legend were placed before us in this more original form, as we have reconstructed it from the existing material. 115 The sum of this interpretation mechanism would be approximately what is told in the myth as it is actually transmitted namely, that his true mother was not a princess, but the poor woman who was introduced as his nurse. Her husband being his father. This interpretation is offered as the tradition, in the reconverted myth, and the fact that this tracing of the progressive mutation furnishes the familiar type of hero myth, is the proof of the correctness of our interpretation. It has thus been our good fortune to show the full accuracy of our interpretative technique through the material itself, and it is now time to demonstrate the tenability of the general viewpoint upon which this entire technique is founded. Hitherto, the results of our interpretation have created the appearance that the entire myth formation started from the hero himself, that is, from the youthful hero. At the start we took this attitude in analogizing the hero of the myth with the ego of the child. Now we find ourselves confronted with the obligation to harmonize these assumptions and conclusions with the other conceptions of myth formation, which they seem to contradict directly. The myths are certainly not constructed by the hero, least of all by the child hero, but they have long been known to be the product of a people of adults. The impetus is evidently supplied by the popular amazement at the apparition of the hero, whose extraordinary life history the people can only imagine as ushered in by a wonderful infancy. This extraordinary childhood of the hero, however, is constructed by the individual mythmakers to whom the indefinite idea of the folk mind must be ultimately traced from the consciousness of their own infancy. In investing the hero with their own infantile history, they identify themselves with him, as it were, claiming to have been similar heroes in their own personality. The true hero of the romance is, therefore, the ego, which finds itself in the hero, by reverting to the time when the ego was itself a hero, through its first heroic act, i.e., the revolt against the father. The ego can only find its own heroism in the days of infancy, and it is therefore obliged to invest the hero with its own revolt, crediting him with the features which made the ego a hero. This object is achieved with infantile motives and materials, in reverting to the infantile romance and transferring it to the hero. Myths are, therefore, created by adults, by means of retrograde childhood fantasies 116 the hero being credited with the mythmaker's personal infantile history. Meanwhile, 
the tendency of this entire process is the excuse of the individual units of the people for their own infantile revolt against the father. Besides the excuse of the hero for his rebellion, the myth therefore contains also the excuse of the individual for his revolt against the father. This revolt has burdened him since his childhood, as he has failed to become a hero. He is now enabled to excuse himself by emphasizing that the father has given him grounds for his hostility. The affectionate feeling for the father is also manifested in the same fiction, as has been shown above. These myths have therefore sprung from two opposite motives, both of which are subordinate to the motive of vindication of the individual through the hero, on the one hand the motive of affection and gratitude toward the parents. And on the other hand, the motive of the revolt against the father. It is not stated outright in these myths, however, that the conflict with the father arises from the sexual rivalry for the mother. But is apparently suggested that this conflict dates back primarily to the concealment of the sexual processes, at childbirth, which in this way became an enigma for the child. This enigma finds its temporary and symbolical solution in the infantile sexual theory of the basket and the water. 117. The profound participation of the incest motif in myth formation is discussed in the author's special investigation of the Lohengrin saga, which belongs to the myth of the birth of the hero. The cyclic character of the Lohengrin saga is referred by him to the fantasy of being one's own son, as revealed by Freud.118 This accounts for the identity of father and son, in certain myths, and for the repetition of their careers. It explains the fact that the hero is sometimes not exposed until he has reached maturity, and also the intimate connection between birth and death in the exposure motif. 119 Young, who regards the typical fate of the hero as the portrayal of the human libido and its typical vicissitudes, has made this theme the pivot of his interpretation, as the fantasy of being born again, to which the incest motif is subordinated. Not only the birth of the hero, which takes place under peculiar symbolic circumstances, but also the motif of the two mothers of the hero. Are explained by Jung through the birth of the hero taking place under the mysterious ceremonials of a rebirth from the mother consort. 120. Having thus outlined the contents of the birth myth of the hero it still remains for us to point out certain complications within the birth myth itself, which have been explained on the basis of its paranoid character as splits of the personality of the royal father and persecutor. In some myths, however, and especially in the fairy tales that belong to this group 121 the multiplication of mythical personages and with them, of course, the multiplication of motifs. Or even of entire stories are carried so far that sometimes the original features are altogether overgrown by these addenda. The multiplication is so variegated and, so exuberantly developed that the mechanism of the analysis no longer does it justice. Moreover, the new personalities here do not show the same independence, as it were, as the new personalities created by splitting, but they rather present the characteristics of a copy, a duplicate, or a double. Which is the proper mythological term? An apparently very complicated example, namely, Herodotus' version of the Cyrus Saga, illustrates that their doubles are not inserted purely for ornamentation, or to give a semblance of historical veracity. But that they are insolubly connected with myth formation and its tendency. Also, in the Cyrus legend, as in the other myths, a confrontation occurs. The royal grandfather, Astyages, and his daughter, with her husband, are confronted by the cattle herder and his wife. A checkered gathering of other personalities which move around them, are readily grouped at sight, between the highborn parent couple and their child stand the administrator Harpagos with his wife and his son, and the noble Artembers with his legitimate offspring. Our trained sense for the peculiarities of myth structure recognizes at once the doubles of the parents in the intermediate parent couples and all the participants are seen to be identical personalities of the parents and their child. This interpretation being suggested by certain features of the myth itself. Harpagos receives the child from the king, to expose it. He therefore acts precisely like the royal father and remains true to his fictitious paternal part in his reluctance to kill the child himself because it is related to him but he delivers it instead to the herder Mithridates. Who is thus again identified with Harpagos? The noble Artembers, whose son Cyrus causes to be whipped, 
is also identified with Harpagos. For when Ardenbears with his whipped boy stands before the king, to demand retribution, Harpagos at once is likewise seen standing before the king, to defend himself, and he also is obliged to present his son to the king. Thus Ardenbears himself plays an epistle part as the hero's father, and this is fully confirmed by the Tesian version, which tells us that the nobleman who adopted the herder's son, Cyrus, as his own son, was named Ardenbears. Even more distinct than the identity of the different fathers is that of their children, which of course serves to confirm the identity of the fathers. In the first place, and this would seem to be conclusive, the children are all of the same age not only the son of the princess, and the child of the herder, who are born at the same time. But Herodot especially emphasizes that Cyrus played the game of kings, in which he caused the son of Ardenbears to be whipped, with boys of the same age as Cyrus. He also points out, perhaps intentionally, that the son of Harpagos, destined to become the playmate of Cyrus, whom the king had recognized, was likewise apparently of the same age as Cyrus. Furthermore, the remains of this boy are placed before his father, Harpagos, in a basket. It was also a basket in which the newborn Cyrus was to have been exposed, and this actually happened to his substitute, the herder's son, whose identity with Cyrus is obvious and tangible in the version of Justin given on page 36. In this report, Cyrus is actually exchanged with the living child of the herders, but this paradoxical parental feeling is reconciled by the consciousness that in reality nothing at all has been altered by this exchange. It appears more intelligible, of course, that the herder's wife should wish to raise the living child of the king, instead of her own stillborn boy, as in the Herodotus version, page 30. But here the identity of the boys is again evident, for just as the herder's son suffered death instead of Cyrus in the past, twelve years later the son of Harpagos, also in a basket, is killed directly for Cyrus, whom Harpagos had allowed to live. 122. The impression is thereby conveyed that all the multiplications of Cyrus, after having been created for a certain purpose, are again removed, as disturbing elements, once this purpose has been fulfilled. This purpose is undoubtedly the exalting tendency that is inherent in the family romance. The hero, in the various duplications of himself and his parents, ascends the social scale from the herder Mithridates, by way of the noble Ardenbears, who is high in the king's favor, and of the first administrator. Harpagos, who is personally related to the king, until he has himself become a prince. So his career is shown in the Tesian version, where Cyrus advances from the herder's son to the king's administrator. 123 In this way, he constantly removes, as it were, the last traces of his ascent, the lower Cyrus being discarded after absolving the different stages of his career. 124. This complicated myth with its promiscuous array of personages is thus simplified and reduced to three actors the hero and his parents. Entirely similar conditions prevail in regard to the cast of many other myths. For example, the duplication may concern the daughter, as in the Moses myth, in which the princess mother, in order to establish the identity of the two families, 125 appears among the poor people as the daughter Miriam. Who is merely a split of the mother, the latter appearing divided into the princess and the poor woman. In case the duplication concerns the father, his doubles appear as a rule in the part of relatives, more particularly as his brothers, as for example in the Hamlet saga, in distinction from the foreign personages created by the analysis. In a similar way, the grandfather, who is taking the place of the father, may also appear complemented by a brother, who is the hero's granduncle, and as such his opponent, as in the myths of Romulus, Perseus, and others. Other duplications, in apparently complicated mythological structures as for example in Kaikisroth, Faradun, and others are easily recognized when envisaged from this angle. The duplication of the fathers, or the grandfathers, by a brother may be continued in the next generation, and concern the hero himself, thus leading to the brother myths, which can only be hinted at in connection with the present theme. The prototypes of the boy, who in the Cyrus saga vanish into thin air after they have served their purpose, the exaltation of the hero's descent, if they were to assume a vitality of their own, would come to confront the hero as competitors with equal rights, namely, as his brothers. 
The original sequence is probably better preserved through the interpretation of the hero's strange doubles as shadowy brothers who, like the twin brother, must die for the hero's sake. Not only the father, who is in the way of the maturing son, is removed, but also the interfering competitor, the brother, in a naive realization of the childish fantasies, for the simple reason that the hero does not want a family. The complications of the hero legends with other myth cycles include, besides the myth of the hostile brothers, which has already been disposed of, also the actual incest myth, such as forms the nucleus of the Oedipus saga. The mother, and her relation to the hero, appear relegated to the background in the myth of the birth of the hero. But there is another conspicuous motif, the lowly mother is so often represented by an animal. This motif of the helpful animals 126 belongs in part to a series of foreign elements, the explanation of which would far exceed the scope of this essay. 127. The animal motif may be fitted into the sequence of our interpretation, on the basis of the following reflections. Much as the projection onto the father justifies the hostile attitude on the part of the son, so the lowering of the mother into an animal is likewise meant to vindicate the ingratitude of the son who denies her. As the persecuting king is detached from the father, so the exclusive role of wet nurse assigned to the mother in this substitution by an animal goes back to the separation of the mother into the parts of the childbearer and the suckler. This cleavage is again subservient to the exalting tendency, in so far as the childbearing part is reserved for the highborn mother, whereas the lowly woman, who cannot be eradicated from the early history, must content herself with the function of nurse. Animals are especially appropriate substitutes, because the sexual processes are here plainly evident also to the child, while the concealment of these processes is presumably the root of the childish revolt against the parents. The exposure in the box and in the water asexualizes the birth process, as it were, in a childlike fashion, the children are fished out of the water by the stork, who takes them to the parents in a basket. 128 The animal fable improves upon this idea, by emphasizing the similarity between human birth and animal birth. This introduction of the motif may possibly be interpreted from the paradistic point of view if we assume that the child accepts the story of the stork from his parents, feigning ignorance, but adding superciliously, if an animal has brought me, it may also have nursed me. 129. When all is said and done, however, and when the cleavage is followed back, the separation of the child-bearer from the suckler which really endeavors to remove the bodily mother entirely. By means of her substitution through an animal or a strange nurse does not express anything beyond the fact, the woman who has suckled me is my mother. This statement is found directly symbolized in the Moses legend, the retrogressive character of which we have already studied. For precisely the woman who is his own mother is chosen to be his nurse, similarly also in the myth of Hercules, and the Egyptian Phoenician Osiris Adonis myth where Osiris, encased in a chest, floats down the river and is finally found under the name Adonis, by Isis, who is installed by Queen Astarte as the nurse of her own son. 130. Only a brief reference can here be made to other motifs which seem to be more loosely related to the entire myth. Such themes include that of playing the fool, which is suggested in animal fables as the universal childish attitude toward grown-ups. They include, furthermore, the physical defects of certain heroes, Zal, Oedipus, Hephaestus, which are meant perhaps to serve for the vindication of individual imperfections. In such a way that the reproaches of the father for possible defects or shortcomings are incorporated into the myth, with the appropriate accentuation the hero being endowed with the same weakness which burdens the self-respect of the individual. This explanation of the psychological significance of the myth of the birth of the hero would not be complete without emphasizing its relations to certain mental diseases. Even readers without psychiatric training or these perhaps more than any others must have been struck with these relations. As a matter of fact, the hero myths are equivalent in many essential features to the delusional ideas of certain psychotic individuals who suffer from delusions of persecution and grandeur the so-called paranoiacs. Their system of delusions is constructed very much like the hero myth, and therefore indicates the same psychogenic themes as the neurotic family romance, which is analyzable.
whereas the system of delusions is inaccessible even for psychoanalytical approaches. For example, the paranoiac is apt to claim that the people whose name he bears are not his real parents, but that he is actually the son of a princely personage. He was to be removed for some mysterious reason, and was therefore surrendered to his parents as a foster child. His enemies, however, wish to maintain the fiction that he is of lowly descent, in order to suppress his legitimate claims to the crown or to enormous riches. 131 cases of this kind often occupy alienists or tribunals. 132. This intimate relationship between the hero myth and the delusional structure of paranoiacs has already been definitely established through the characterization of the myth as a paranoid structure, which is here confirmed by its contents. The remarkable fact that paranoiacs will frankly reveal their entire romance has ceased to be puzzling, since the profound investigations of Freud have shown that the contents of hysterical fantasies, which can often be made conscious through analysis, are identical up to the minutest details with the complaints of persecuted paranoiacs. Moreover, the identical contents are also encountered as a reality in the arrangements of perverts for the gratification of their desires. 133. The egotistical character of the entire system is distinctly revealed by the paranoiac, for whom the exaltation of the parents, as brought about by him, is merely the means for his own exaltation. As a rule the pivot for his entire system is simply the culmination of the family romance, in the apodictic statement, I am the emperor, or God. Reasoning in the symbolism of dreams and myths which is also the symbolism of all fancies, including the morbid power of imagination all he accomplishes thereby is to put himself in the place of the father. Just as the hero terminates his revolt against the father. This can be done in both instances, because the conflict with the father which dates back to the concealment of the sexual processes, as suggested by the latest discoveries is nullified at the instant when the grown boy himself becomes a father. The persistence with which the paranoiac puts himself in the father's place, i.e. becomes a father himself, appears like an illustration to the common answers of little boys to a scolding or a putting off of their inquisitive curiosity, you just wait until I am a papa myself, and I'll know all about it. Besides the paranoiac, his equally a social counterpart must also be emphasized. In the expression of the identical fantasy contents, the hysterical individual, who has suppressed them, is offset by the pervert, who realizes them. And just so the diseased and passive paranoiac who needs his delusion for the correction of the actuality, which to him is intolerable is offset by the active criminal, who endeavors to change the actuality according to his mind. In this special sense, this type is represented by the anarchist. The hero himself, as shown by his detachment from the parents, begins his career in opposition to the older generation, he is at once a rebel, a renovator, and a revolutionary. However, every revolutionary is originally a disobedient son, a rebel against the father. 134. Compare the suggestion of Freud, in connection with the interpretation of a revolutionary dream. 135. But whereas the paranoiac, in conformity with his passive character, has to suffer persecutions and wrongs which ultimately proceed from the father and which he endeavors to escape by putting himself in the place of the father or the emperor the anarchist complies more faithfully with the heroic character. By promptly himself becoming the persecutor of kings, and finally killing the king, precisely like the hero. The remarkable similarity between the career of certain anarchistic criminals and the family romance of hero and child has been elsewhere illustrated by the author, through special instances. 136 The truly heroic element then consists only in the real justice or even necessity of the act, which is therefore generally endorsed and admired. 137 While the morbid trait, also in criminal cases, is the pathologic transference of the hatred from the father to the real king, or several kings, when more general and still more distorted. As the hero is commended for the same deed, without asking for its psychic motivation, so the anarchist might claim indulgence from the severest penalties. For the reason that he has killed an entirely different person from the one he really intended to destroy, in spite of an apparently excellent, perhaps political, motivation of his act. 138. 
For the present let us stop at the narrow boundary line where the contents of innocent infantile imaginings, suppressed and unconscious neurotic fantasies, poetical myth structures, and certain forms of mental disease and crime lie close together, although far apart as to their causes and dynamic forces. We resist the temptation to follow one of these divergent paths that lead to altogether different realms, but which are as yet unblazed trails in the wilderness.